Good evening. Uh, this lecture is Rat Hashem Le Refuat Mori Nisim Ben Eti Esther Refuat Shlema. Also, that's Lacha in the uh, upcoming court case of Edna Shoshani. And that's uh, Lachat Aviela Batsara. Le Refuat Shanas Dvora Elisheva Batsara. Le Eloi Nishmat Avraham Ben Ephraim. And Lerfua David Ben Aliza Malka. Okay, now one announcement before we start. Uh, Thursday it's a fast day, Tani Tester. It was supposed to be on Shabbat, so they made it on Thursday. But usually when we have Tani Tester, the fast of Esther is finishing with the reading of the Megillah. Since it's not the correct time, so they made it earlier, the Reading of the Megillah will be Saturday night. People finish the Arvit, they go home, they do Avdala, they come back to read the Megillah. Or, you know, every place with his Minagim. Uh, Sunday morning, it's Tfilah of Shachrit, Purim. And there is also Kriyat Megillah in Tfilah Shachrit. And Purim, it's mitzvah to do a seuda, you have to do it in a day, daytime. Usually around 1, 2, 2 30 p.m. Better to pray mincha first and then do the seuda, because we get drunk, people get drunk, and then they don't remember, they pray, they don't pray, they don't know what they did. You're not supposed to pray when you're drunk. The, uh, there's big arguments about the term drunk. It's a, it's a very ugly word, drunk. The Chachamim say that a person has to drink lit basem, to, to feel great, because you know when you drink wine, uh, it makes you happy. And the more the wine you, you drink, the more happy you become. But there's a red line. Once you get to a certain, uh, certain situation, you're starting to do bad things. And that's already become Chilul Hashem, which is the biggest sin from the Torah. So use your common sense. You come to do an important rabbinical mitzvah, and in the end you, it will cause you to commit the worst sin from the Torah. You want to invest a dollar to lose a million dollars? Obviously it's stupid, no? So you have to know when to hold yourself. Some people that drink, like I drink, I never get drunk. So I don't worry about it. I can drink wine, whiskey, I don't get drunk. My father also, Allah Shalom, was also like that. You never saw him do some, something stupid, even if in a wedding, in this, with friends, they drink, lechaim. Some people, they drink one or two cups, they're starting to act like monkeys jumping on chairs, on the table, saying stupid thing, offending people. People like this should never touch alcohol, ever. That's one of the reasons that the Arabs, Muhammad told them in Allah to touch alcohol. With their temper, he gave them a little alcohol without that, just look what's going on in the world. Imagine now if they start drinking alcohol every day. Hashem Yerachem. It's dangerous. Alcohol is dangerous if you don't know, if you don't have discipline. So we have one day a year that we're allowed to drink extra. If you want to drink a little bit on Shabbat, no problem. Control. In weddings, no problem. Control. You can't control, you're not allowed to touch, not even a taste. Purim mitzvah to get drunk. But not to get drunk, to vomit in the, in the middle of the street like some teenagers do ending up in a hospital with alcohol poisoning. That's a very, very big crime to end like that. Very big crime. You gotta be very, very careful. So if you know yourself that you have a bad record, stay away, drink one or two cups of wine, it's enough. Don't worry, you don't go to hell for not getting drunk on Purim. But you will go to hell if you're gonna do Chilul Hashem, for sure. So you use common sense. We make a meal with a mozi in a, in, a, in a day of Purim, we say al anisim, the Mordechai. So we say al anisim in the Tfilat Shmona Yisre, after uh, Modim, and also in Birkat Amazon. Also in Birkat Amazon. If someone forgot, he doesn't repeat. He doesn't repeat the Tfilat. 
עוני פורים, איזו מצווה to give money for the poor people. The more the better. But there is always a minimum. What's the minimum? It's written, משלו, הנה מגילה, it's written, משלוח מנות איש לרעהו, so that's in singular language, at least one meal from one individual to another, משלוח מנות, מנות it's in plural, so it has to be at least two, two different kinds of food. You can give wafers and uh, bamba, I don't know, or pretzels. Also, you can give one kind of food and one drink. A little grape juice. Usually they give one wafer and this, that's it. You already fulfill your obligation to one person. Men to men, women to women. Not men to, to women and women to men. It's not modest. Men will give to men, women to women. Usually people like to give to people they love and appreciate and have gratitude to. Usually this is the way you always have to operate. Those who you owe them more, you have to give them more respect and more gratitude and more payback for those you owe. In this particular manner, it's the other way around. Better to give to someone that is not in good term with you, to break the ice, to make peace. You know, someone you already love and he loves you with or without your mishloach manot, you'll still be okay. So, So for what, minimum two kinds of food to one individual, make sure that that individual is someone that make brachot on the food, because there's a big question if you're allowed to give food to a Jew that doesn't make brachot on the food. And according to some poskim, it's not a mitzvah b'chlal. To give someone that doesn't make bracha food, could be chas v'shalom avera, lifnei iver lo titen michshol. או מסייע לידי עוברי עבירה, which is איסור דה רבנן. So to, go, to get out of the doubt, make sure that your משלוח מנות go to a kosher person. Now, if you want to give to 20 different people, you're allowed, the more the better. But the minimum to one person and two kinds of food. One more recommendation based on uh, experience. Usually people like to cook in a house or to bake cakes, all kinds of things, and to give it to people. Not everybody count on your kashrut, with all due respect to your yarmulke and your beard. People are afraid. Someone gives them, I don't know what they do in the kitchen, how, how, how much halachot they know, did they check the flour from warmth, they did, there's all kinds of issues. From experience, better to get something from the store that has a kosher certificate on it. And a good one. Like this, no doubt, nobody is afraid to eat. You give someone a, a bowl of rice. And they begin to think, you know, where is this rice from? That, this one, I don't know what, did he cook it in Chalavi, Besari, is it dairy, is not dairy? A lot of questions. Give them something, I don't know, bag of pretzel, you see the Ashgaha, finished. Bamba, you see the Ashgaha, but that's finished. One more thing. Matanot la'evionim has to be at least two people. Evionim, it's plural. It doesn't say matana la'evion. Matana la'evion mean one. Matanot la'evionim, gifts to the poor, it's in plural. So it has to be minimum two. Also men to men, women to women. It has to be done on a day of Purim, which is this coming Sunday. It can be done through Zell, Venmo, something that is instant, that a person can grab the money right away if you want. It can be done through a messenger. Every year people ask me, do you give matanot la evionim? The answer is yes. We have, I have a list of evionim, unfortunately, all the way from here to Manhattan. If you see how many messages I get from people, you read my text messages and uh, emails, people don't have what to eat. Someone yesterday told me he cannot afford one slice of pizza. I asked him how much a pizza costs. He told me three dollars. I said, pizza? I cannot afford. He said, no, cannot afford a slice of pizza. This is the world we live in. Some people cannot afford even a bottle of water. Bottle of water. So there are people like this. Now, when you give matanot le'evionim, there is also preferences. Someone that is a Talmid Chacham who sits and learns Torah all day comes before everyone. Even before your relatives, before your Ani Eircha, before your friends, before your neighbors, for anyone you know. 
someone who sits and learns Torah revives the world, give the world existence. They are the most important people in the world. Whenever in your life, get it to your head, whenever you see someone that is a Talmud Yeshiva, whether he's single, whether he's married, for you, you have to look at him like he's almost a god. You cannot look at any human being like a god that's become a Vodazara, but almost. I'm talking about the amount of respect you have to give to... How do you tell me if somebody is a Vion? Huh? How do you tell me if somebody is a Vion? Not everybody knows who is an Evion, because the Evionim are now walking with a flag, like the abomination people, to show their uh, mental disease to the world. The Evionim are hiding it. Who do they come to? To rabbis. The rabbi of the shul, to someone that they can trust, that they will keep it secret. So they're not running, hey, I'm poor, can anyone help me? Usually it doesn't happen. So if you have anyone you trust, you know it's going to give it on the day of Purim, you can give over there. Uh, I gave a few people, a zeal of few uh, poor people, can send them directly. But the problem is that not all poor people want to be exposed. Some poor people don't want that their telephone number or their email will be exposed to the world. And they're very sensitive about it. So what do we do? For me, they're not embarrassed. After all, they come to me for help. I get whatever people send, I write it down, I have the full amount, and I divide it to people and give it to them. Usually, almost all the poor people I give to are Bnei Torah, people that sit and learn. I always prefer to help those who learn Torah before other people. Where is my source? There's hundreds of sources. There's hundreds of, literally hundreds of sources. I give you one, in the Gemara it says that uh, the rabbi was, he had a fund, a fund of charity that he was giving money to the people. Everyone that came, poor people, hungry people, hungry people came to the rabbi for food. So he asked him, what did you learn today? I told him, I learned Mara, I learned Mishnah, I learned this, I learned that, I learned Alachot. So everyone who say, I learned, he gave him food. Then one person says, I didn't learn today, so I cannot give you. Say to him, why? Because I didn't learn your why, you cannot give me? Say, no, you don't, you, I cannot give you. I only give to people that learn Torah. Mm-hmm. So what did he say to him? Give me like I'm a raven or a cat. Parneseni, kakelev, kakelev u kaorev. Give me like a food, like a dog. If you see a dog walking here and he's hungry, you wouldn't give him something to eat? If you see a raven looking for food, crowing everywhere. You wouldn't give him something to eat? You give him. Think I'm a dog. Give me like, like you give to a dog. Why I'm hungry? Why do you have such a Gemara? Why the Chachamim put such a story in a Gemara? To show you that technically, technically, of course no one does it today, don't jump to conclusion. Technically, people that don't learn Torah don't deserve to get food. Of course, if someone will come to you and say, I'm, I'm hungry, well, even if he's a non-Jew, you give him. I don't know you, I don't know who you are, you tell me you're hungry, I'll give you food. Even the Gemara say, you have to give even to non-Jews. Man, your brothers, you have obligation to revive them. But even come a stranger on the street, it's not, it's not Jewish, not religious, not nothing. Could be an idol worshiper even, don't know. So I'm hungry, you give him. Not nim lo mipnei darke shalom to multiply the peace in the world, not to create uh, tension. But f- from the Gemara we understand that literally if there was really 100% justice in this world and people will use only their brain, not their heart, someone who does not learn Torah doesn't deserve to get food today. Go figure. You know, I mean, <laughs> people give millions to all kinds of causes and in the end, they'll find out there was a sin, not a mitzvah. What did you do? I gave three million dollar charity this year. Where did you give? To the reform shul, big crime. To the conservative, big crime. To those cult of idol worshippers, big crime. To this family of Mechalelei Shabbat, it's also a sin. I help people, my friend doesn't have a car, I gave him my car, but he drives it on Shabbat, it's a sin. He'll be punished for it. I wanted to help a friend. He wanted to move his apartment. But he's not religious. I'm religious. The only day I can give him my car is on Shabbat when I don't use it. Not allowed. He'll be punished for it. 
Someone wants to go on a trip. Even your own son. Say, Abba, I need money. Why? I'm going with my friends tomorrow to the mountains. You know, he's going to drive on Shabbat. Your son is not religious. He needs money for gas and for tolls, I don't know, for whatever he needs for the trip. You give him money, you become a partner to his crime that he's driving on Shabbat. If you give him monthly, monthly allowance, you don't tell him what to use it for. He, then he chooses to use it for whatever he wants. He doesn't give you a report. So you don't have a crime in it. But if you give him for the particular trip that you know he's taking on Shabbat, you become a partner to the crime. Tov, there was the introduction. Also, there's mitzvah of machatzit shekel for those who didn't do it yet. Before they read the Megillah, you're going to see in a synagogue boxes with money, with coins. You take five coins, you take it, you put money. It's like you bought the coins, you put some money. You can put $20 a person. If you have a large family, $10 a person. It's zecher lemachatzit shekel You don't say machatzit shekel because there's no obligation of machatzit shekel There's no Bet Mikdash today. You say zecher, memory, to the mitzvah of machatzit shekel Memory. Zecher lemachatzit shekel you put the donation in a box, finished. You can also say, you can also send money, zecher lemachatzit shekel also, and we give it to the poor. Also possible. Since it's zecher, it's only a memory. It's not the actual mitzvah of the coin of machatzit shekel so, remember, two times reading of the Megillah, Motzei Shabbos, Saturday night, followed the schedule of Yashul, and uh, Sunday morning, mitzvah of uh, Saudat Purim, to eat meat. If you don't like meat, at least chicken. If you don't like chicken and meat, do a nice fish. Respectable meal with bread. And drink a lot of wine. Only if you don't get too drunk and start doing stupid things. If you already have a record that you embarrass your family and your wife in public when you drink or you end up in a hospital, then you better don't drink at all or drink very little, just, you know, okay. Also, there's a question if you're allowed to get drunk from whiskey or cognac, or, or it has to be wine. There's a question in a post scheme. Some say it has to be wine, some say it can be also other alcohol. I have a rule, when there is a disagreement on something, some say yes, some say no, always better to go to the strict. Since it's not really a big deal, you have wine. So today you won't drink whiskey, today you'll get drunk from the wine. The other time you can drink on Shabbat, holidays, but if now, according to all opinion, if you drink wine, According to all opinion, you did it in the best way. If you drink whiskey, according to some, it's good. According to some, it's not good. <coughs> I think I covered <coughs> more or less everything. Purim, it's a very special day. You know, the, the Torah, Hashem called Yom HaKippurim, the Atonement Day. The Atonement Day, Hashem uh, called it Kippurim. Yom Yom HaKippurim. Kippurim sounds like Kepurim. It's like Purim. Meaning, Purim is such an important day. Purim is such an important day that Yom Kippur is almost as great as Purim. Why? Why there is, what's the significance of... Uh, what's the significance of... Benji, can you explain to them? They all look at it. They don't know what's going on. <laughs> I, I want them to listen to me, not to, you know. Okay, now they got the point, fine. Okay, so the, the, the Purim, the, some of the Dole Israel, the Ariya Kadosh and others says that whatever you pray with your heart on a day of Purim, Hashem will give you. That's how great is this day. Remember, the entire holiday is rabbinical, just like Hanukkah, it's Chag Purim. The story of Purim. And that brings us to tonight's topic. Last night in uh, Queens, I spoke three hours almost. That was part one of the lecture of Purim. Now, today, we're going to do part two. And tomorrow, I have another lecture in Queens. We're going to do part three. So, so.
So what do you have to do? You have to listen better to listen to the one from last night. You have it on the on the app, on the repeat. And you also have it on the on the, on my YouTube page, you always have live. You click on live, you see last night's lecture is still there. So you can even before we post the lecture online on the YouTube, you have it from the live broadcast. So if you don't want to wait until we post it, just click on live and watch it. You can watch already tonight, later or tomorrow morning. You can watch last night lecture and then you watch this lecture. You know what I mean? Not you, the people that are listening online. It doesn't matter, even if you listen in the opposite order, you still get the point. All right? So let's move on. So yesterday I finished, last night lecture, I finished with uh, uh, the story of Hashverosh make it, made a party. Vashti made a party for the women. They go in when they drink. You know, when a person drinks, he's inside exposed out. If he's someone that is a big Talmud Chacham, he knows a lot of Torah, the more he will get drunk, the more unbelievable Torah will come out. If it's some kind of a low life, the more he drink, the more violence and curse and garbage and all kinds of not modest things are going to come out of his mouth. Why? This is an opportunity to see the secrets of that person. You want to know who the person is? Let him drink a little bit, see what comes out of his mouth. Is he going to talk nice divrei Torah, all kinds of spiritual things? Even though it looks silly a little bit by the way he talks and by the way he moves, but see what comes out of his mouth. That's the inside of him that usually he doesn't expose to the world. He's free now. If it's someone that cares and speaks all kinds of bad things and who knows what else, when you let him drink, you see what happens. Knock down table, looking for people to fight, can even shoot someone. Why? Because this is who he is. This is the inside of the person. I remember uh, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, my rabbi in yeshiva, is a big tzaddik, tzaddik yisod olam, Rav Rafael Rosenman. Still in Monsi today, still teaching, same, same, same devotion to Torah. He's, he has nothing in his life besides Torah. Torah is his whole world. Even when he walked on the street, he used to walk with walkmen. You know why? Because he wore, he doesn't have a car, so he walked with a bag full of, with a bag full of books. And it takes him 20 minutes to go from one, he teach half a day here and half a day somewhere else. While he's walking, he has 20 minutes walk. He listens to, uh, to different Torah, not to waste time. So on Purim, we came to give him Mishloach Manot. We were a few students. By now, he was uh, already drinking a lot. He was like this on his chair. And son-in-law was there, another Talmud Chacham. We walked into his house. You know, Sfaradim, when they see Chacham, what do they do? They kiss his hand. That's the custom of the Sfaradim. So all the Sfaradim come, they kiss his hand. Now, usually he's such a shy man. You'll never see him talking or bragging or anything like this. <laughs> like we say in Hebrew, mitbayesh me'atzel shel atzmo. He's embarrassed from his own shadow. That's usually how he is. But you know, when he was probably after two, three bottles of wine by now, the inside of him was exposed fully. So he said to his son-in-law, I love this Faradim. Look how they respect Chachamim. They all come. <laughs> they kiss their hands. So he said, now it's your chance. You will tell me any verse you want from the Tanakh, from 24 books of the Tanakh. Any verse you want. And I will give you, Bezrat Hashem, two-hour speech on that pasuk. <laughs> like this. <laughs> then we had one wise guy with us. A serious wise guy. I don't know where he got that pasuk from. I never heard that before and never heard it after. Some pasuk that nobody ever, ever focused on. I don't know where he got it from. <laughs> He told him some pasuk from one of the prophets' book. And he started to talk and talk and talk and talk. It doesn't look like, like an ocean. This is when you have a chacham. Let him, let him drink a little bit. Shh. 
an explosion of the Niagara Falls instead of water, Torah comes out. You come to someone else, an Amaretz, Rashon Ara, gossip, curses, violent, yelling, screaming, what are you looking at? I'm about to chop your head off. This is who he is, and this is who he is. So when the wine comes in, you begin to see who the person is. Now when Achashverosh and all the other goim over there, the ministers, they drink. What comes out? Their desire to women. It's being exposed now. Usually when they're not drunk, they will hide it. But now when they're drunk, there's no boundaries. So they started to argue which, wom- which women are prettier. The Persians. The, the one from Madai, the one from Bavel, they are different countries. Every minister has different roots. Everybody tried to say that the women in his place are prettier. And they had an idea. Let me prove to you who my wife is, Achashverosh said. Vashti, the queen, the grand-granddaughter of Nebuchadnezzar from Bavel, the one who destroyed the first temple. She was a very, very pretty, supposedly the prettiest on, on, in the whole world. So Achashverosh wants to break to all his drunk friends, while he himself is drunk. Call Vashti to come. Now he wants Vashti to come and expose herself. But Hashem gave her leprosy, tzarat. Mida keneged mida, measure for measure, for torturing the Jewish girls, making them work, and force them to dress not modest. So the same thing Hashem did to her. Now she's ordered to come, like a fashion show, but she has rash in all over her skin. So she can't, she's going to be a big embarrassment for so she refused to come. And Haman, Haman right away took advantage. King, your majesty, you have to execute her. I'm sorry, it's your wife, I know you love her, but you cannot tolerate such behavior. All the women now in the 127 countries that you're in charge of, they will all disrespect their husband. Remember, there was no feminism yet. <laughs> Nobody ever thought about such an idea that a woman will control the man and the world and become the president of Germany. There was no such thing. So they all got shocked. What, the king asked her to come and she refused to come? How can it be? She must die. But Achashverosh knew that the Jewish scholars are more merciful <laughs> than on Rush to kill. <laughs> Why Haman want Vashti dead? Why? Because he wants his daughter to become the wife of the king Achashverosh. That's the whole idea. He wants to grab the kingdom. If his daughter will marry king Achashverosh, then she will have a child. Once he dies, Haman has enough money to gain power for his grandson to make him the king of 127 countries. It's all politics, just like today. So Haman is telling him, you must kill her, you must kill her, he cannot forgive such thing. He comes to the rabbis, the rabbis are in a Megillah, it's called Yodei Aitim, who knows how to calculate times. What does it mean? Rosh Chodesh, Lipir, Chachamim with the moon, with the, with the cycle of the moon, they know Hashem gave us this wisdom in Mount Sinai how to know when to push another month to the calendar, like this year, Adar Bet, to know that Passover will not be too early, it will not be too cold, it has to be on the spring. Hashem gave Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, a lot of secrets how to control the calendar and how certain days will never fall on specific days of the week. It's brilliant, the calendar. It's brilliant. It's, it's unbelievable. If you learn the secrets of the calendar, you get the shock of your life. That people actually controlled it and wrote the calendar. Hillel, the grandson of Hillel, wrote the calendar. But before the calendar, everything was done every month manually. So he came to the rabbis, Yodea team, and the rabbi said, whatever we're going to tell him, we're going to suffer for it. If we tell him, kill Vashti, tomorrow he will wake up, he's not drunk. Where is Vashti? The rabbis told you to execute your lovely wife. They didn't even check why she didn't show up. What do you, what do you mean she checked? What, they're supposed to check the skin condition of her? So whatever they're going to say, they're going to blame the Jews. 
If they say leave her alive, they will also blame the Jews. You see, all the women now in Persia disrespect their husband because of the advice the rabbis gave you. You know, one of these things, whatever you say, one person came to Rabbi Uri Zohar, Alava Shalom. He's the biggest Baal Shuvah of our generation in the whole world. The biggest. What he was and what he became, literally, it's from the bottom of the bottom to the top of all tops. Perfect Shuvah he made. Perfect in everything. So they came to him and said to him, I know that my, my friend is cheating on her husband with another man. Do I have an obligation to go tell the husband or no? Rav Uri Zohar was smart. You know, whatever you answer, it's going to be bad. <laughs> Someone is going to come to kill you from the wife's side, from the husband's side. He came to one very big gadol, I think it was Rav Yashiv maybe. So Rav Uri Zohar's reaction, why, why are you asking me? From all the people in the world, you chose me to ask such a question. <laughs> Meaning, no matter what I answer you, I have a problem with Hashem. If I tell you be quiet, Hashem is going to blame me. Hey, what do you mean be quiet? She's forbidden to her husband. If I say, go and say, I say, why did you rush to break a house? It's one of these things. What's the answer? I'm not telling you. Why should I get into trouble? <laughs> What's the answer? Who knows? Depend if he will believe you or not. If he would live in denial, better not to tell him. Why? Because now every second it will be a for, uh, 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 an intentional sin. He's not allowed to touch his wife from this moment on. His marriage is over. If he continued to be intimate with his wife, which is no longer available to him after such what she did, that's from that moment on, every time he will touch his wife, it's a sin. Because he was told. But if he will believe and will cut right away the marriage, then you have to tell him. So it's, in the end, it's depend if he will accept it or not. If he won't accept it, you made it worse. Till now, he was innocently living without knowing. It's not, an, it's not a prophet. How is he supposed to know? Now when you told him and he continued to do it, it became worse, actually. So, Abotai, now Vashti refused to come. The Chachamim don't know what to do. They had a great idea. The Chachamim told the Hashverosh, we are unable to answer your question if to kill Vashti or not. Since the destruction of the temple, which temple? The first one. There was no second temple yet. Since the destruction of the temple, Hashem forbid us for judging cases of life and death. Because we don't have Sanhedrin. You need Sanhedrin sitting in Elishkat Gazit in Bet HaMikdash. Since the house of the Supreme Court, of the Rabbinical Court, was destroyed, we have no permission to answer questions on life and death. That's how they got away with him. Because they knew whatever they tell him, it's going to turn against the Jews, as usual, as always. So that's where we left last night. So now Rabotai, Haman pushed to get rid of Vashti. They got rid of Vashti. Now they're going on a hunt to look for a pretty replacement. They go around, they check women, they bring them, you know, interview this whole nine yard, and they saw Esther. Esther, the Jewish girl, which is not such a girl anymore. She was already older. They bring Esther. Mordechai is, a, is her uncle. Mordechai is a member in the Sanhedrin. It's a big chacham. Uh, Esther is his nephew. He actually raised her. She has no parents. She's an orphan. Mordechai raised her. Mordechai. Huh? Niz. Niz. What did I say? No, Niz is a female. Yeah, Niz. She's a niece of uh, Mordechai. Mordechai is her uncle. And, and they bring her. Now, Esther, remember, Esther is not pretty like the goyot that they found. She has a special chen on her. 
some kind of a spiritual appeal that uh, people see her, they are very impressed. Some people are not necessarily good looking in the term of pretty face, but they have, I don't know, charisma or chen of Hashem on them, like a spell of God on them, that no matter where they go, they become the highlight of the place. So she is like that. The Gemara says she's here a croquet, she's not even pretty, she's on the green side, pale, yellow, whatever that means. But everyone who sees her is very impressed, I guess because she's so modest and so righteous. So they bring Esther, Menachashverosh, from all the women. Who does he like? Esther. Who, who's behind the scene here? What's going on here? The Gemara say the salvation, if you can put your finger in a moment that the salvation of the Jewish people officially began. The story of the Megillah is nine years from the beginning, until the last Pasuk of the Megillah, nine years. We read it in 40 minutes, but it's nine years. Through the Megillah, if you have to put your finger on a word or in a verse in the Megillah, that that's when everything turned around. Meaning now there is a decree, there's a final solution, there is a Hitler, Imach Shimon, named Haman, is Amalek, Haman Agagi, come from the family of Agag, the king of Amalek. So now there is a decree to destroy all Jews in the next month of Adar. But where you can put the finger, when is the moment that things started to change to the positive side? When? Who knows? You may think first Haman make the decree. And then comes the salvation. But with Hashem it's not like that. Whenever there is a decree against the Jew, when the decree comes to the world, it's only after Hashem already prepared the medicine for it, the remedy. Makdim, trufa, lamaka. Hashem actually prepared the remedy before the decree comes, or the sickness, or the bruise, or whatever happened to you, or you just lost a lot of money, already Hashem planted the seed where money is going to come to you. I just, before I came in, for those of you who waited for me outside, I was on the phone, I spoke to someone in Israel. This someone is, a, if you remember, I spoke about him many, I don't know, a year ago, a year and a half ago. He has 13 kids. He's a vrech in my kolel. Tzaddik, what is tzaddik? This is one of these people that two minutes is next to you, you fall in love with him. You don't want to lose him as a friend for the rest of your life. No matter what, you never let him go. He's so warm and so friendly and so loving. You know, one of these people. But, you know, 13 kids, <laughs> life in Jerusalem is very expensive. It's like living in Manhattan. Try to imagine your life in Manhattan with 13 kids. How much you need every month. So I wanted to send him some money. Yeah. Uh, you, you need messengers. Finally, one person asked me, can, uh, can uh, you give me here over here $2,000 and I'll give you the money in Israel through my brother? His brother is a tzaddik. I said, actually, it's a great, very good idea. That's exactly the amount I had in mind to send to this guy. So I said to him, perfect, yeah. I sell him the money. He let his brother know. I send his brother a message. Here is the telephone number of this tzaddik. I already knew that when they talk, right away they become friends. Two tzaddikim meet, what happened? Divre Torah, where you from, what this, the Gemara, this. Right away they fell in love with each other. You should see the message he recorded for me this morning, I heard. So now he called me to say thank you. Just before I walked in, he told me, can I tell you a story? He said to me in the morning, I got a notice from the bank that if I don't come, to put 7,000 shekel today in the in account. They close, they shut my account, and it goes for collection, and I'm finished. That's it, I cannot open a bank account. Desperate situation. 
I say to myself, well, where in the world I will get 7,000 shekel now in Israel? And I start knocking on doors, people give me shekel, half a shekel, five shekel, and there's no chance. So he said, you know, I went to the Kotel, and I started to talk to Hashem, Hashem, please help me. I don't care all the suffering that I have, but just can you, at least one favor you do to me. Help me to be a true follower of you in emuna and confidence that I will have parnasa without any efforts that I will be fully confident in you I don't have to worry look at me how I'm nervous now with the bank is calling me every minute are you coming to put money you have negative balance are you coming are you coming you know the banks they smile to you when you bring money when the things don't work so smooth the faces become not so friendly so just when I stand there in a the kotel and thinking, Ma'ayin Yavo Ezri and Hashem, please help me, that I will, no matter what happened to me, I won't at least die from inside from fear. You know, the, you have fear, you don't know what's, what, what's going to be. He said, I didn't even finish to talk to Hashem, I get a call. And he said to me, usually, you know, the whole world is calling me, because he has a good reputation of a tzaddik. So a lot of people call in for blessing, for advice, you know. He say, usually I cannot answer the phone, you know. Every call I see, I don't know who they are. It's going to take my whole day. I usually don't answer unless I recognize the number. But I was thinking to myself, I'm right now begging to Hashem, and there's a phone call right now. Maybe it's related. <laughs> That's what I had in my mind. I answer. Who is it? The guy. My messenger. So if you believe me that that's exactly how it was? And I say, Hashem, ta'azor li shiye li emunah ve bitachon bechalet sona maski. You want to give me, you don't want to give me, I don't care. At least let me live with that comfortably. <laughs> Other people, Hashem, how can you do it to me? What? Do you want me on the street? They're going to close my bank account, all my checks will return, penalties. It's big fear. Everything is supervised by Hashem. His remedy before the bank contacted him was a day and a half before when I got the call from the guy. Can you give me the money here and my brother will give it to you in Israel? That message was his remedy. You understand how it works or no? That's how it always is. We say it every morning in the prayers. Baruch gozer umkayem. Bless be the God who makes the decree, but he gives us the strength to handle it, meaning he already prepared the solution before. So that's how it goes. So now, after giving you this nice speech, this inspiring speech, where in the Megillah is the turning point? Remember, the whole concept of Purim is Venafohu, that everything bad and dark and ugly and discouraging and whatever you want to call it can turn around 180 degrees in a second in a second boom wow how can it be revolution the answer the Gemara say the moment that Vashti say that she does not want to come who made Vashti not come if you call the prettiest Goya in the world, which happened to be a queen from a royal family of the Babylonian Empire. You know what a show of she was? And she was a very evil woman also. Just like her parents. They're all evil. Her father, his, her grandfather, Evil Merodach, Balshatsar, Nebuchadnezzar. What a genealogy she comes from. One Hitler after the other. She's a billionaire, the prettiest woman in the world, a granddaughter of the dictator that destroyed the temple and controlled the whole world and killed 20 million people. She would run to show her beauty to the drunk men. <laughs> but she messed it up. He gave her a rush that day. That's the only way she would not agree to come any other way, she can handle it. 
he gave her something that she, that the goyim would tell her, come on, what is this? You rabbit sin? What are you covered like that? Show us your beauty. You know, they drank the goyim. Hey, drink. Come on, take this jacket off. <laughs> oh, they're going to see all kinds of uh, stains on the, on the skin. Be disgusting. That second is the beginning of everything is turning around. It will take us time to understand. But Bashamayim, this is when Hashem turned the switch from zero to one. It will take time until the lights comes on. You know, there is a delay. Sometimes you put your AC on, 100 degrees, 100% humidity. I'm dying in the house. It's like sauna here. You press, you put on 65, the air condition, nothing. They have a delay, five minutes. By the time you finally hear the fan, wow, Baruch Hashem, something comes out. It's, in the beginning, it's like an oven. You're counting the second. By the time you're, the house starting to cool, you're already all sticky and sweaty. Same thing over here. It may take you time to see. But in Shamaim, it was already decreed. So, they bring Esther to the palace. How did she agree? I'm sorry, Esther, with all due respect, the Jewish nation is in a big problem. There is a decree to destroy them. We understand the point. There's massive anti-Semitism. There's a minister, there's a Amman in Machshimo, a serious hater. But uh, how do you agree to go to be a wife of a non-Jewish king? A Jewish woman allowed to let a goy touch her? <laughs> so, if you see what happens to women who went with a non-Jewish man in the, in the opposite world, it's a big problem. It's not allowed. The Zohar talks about it. If they convert, they convert. They're Jewish. It's no problem. This is the main problem of the Jewish nation, 70% assimilation. That's why we are the smallest nation in the world. We should have been 4 billion people. We started in the same generation like the Chinese, 4,200 years ago. We started in the same generation like the first Chinese, the father of China, Sini. It's in Parashat Noach. How many Chinese you have? Two, two billion with restriction on birth. And we did not have restriction on birth. We should have had double amount of the Chinese. Should have been four billion Jews. In reality, how, how many Jews you have in the world? 15 million. The main reasons are not the pogroms and the Holocaust and the Goim killing us. That's one reason. The main reason is the silent Holocaust. The silent. Most holocaust and pogroms were very noisy. Everybody saw it, everybody heard about it, and everyone remember it. Everyone remember the holocaust in Germany and in Poland, and the destruction of the first temple and the second temple, and pogroms that the Arabs made in Israel in the 1920s. It's all documented. It's a part of history. You cannot hide those pogroms. Everyone will remember September 11, what happened in America. Everyone will remember October 7 in a thousand years from now. Things like this will never be erased. But the silent Holocaust is in front of us, is every second, and nobody barely pays attention to it. How the children of God neglected him, betrayed him, and broke one of the main rules of the Torah that he did not give us permission to mix with other nations. And again, not for racist reasons. Not because we are better than the Goim. No, sometimes the Goim are better than us. There are many Goim that are very righteous, nice, elegant, generous, good people. Hashem loves them very much. He loved this Goy. You ask him, who do you love more, this Goy or this Jew? I love this Goy a hundred times more than I love this Jew. Nice person. He cares about me, he respects me, he loves the religion, he helps, he donates. A great person. And what about this Jewish girl? Disaster. Doesn't believe in me, don't care about mitzvot, don't care about Shabbat, eat whatever she wants. She's not a good girl. So the guy is better than her. So he's doing her a favor. Technically, yes. It's no question that he's better than her. But it's not allowed. That's what the Torah said, not allowed. 
Now, again, some people think, oh, the Torah is racist, the Torah is prejudiced. Why? Well, the Jews are something special? No. If the Jew is righteous, he's special. If he's wicked, he's a disaster. And a horrible hell is waiting for him. He won't be able to say, I'm a grandson of such an important tzaddik. We won't help him. Your grandfather is in heaven, and you have to go to furnace number seven. We prepare for you over there, uh, you know. What are you going to say? I'm a grandson of this. I'm a, my last name is uh, Karo. I'm a grandson of the Rabbi Yosef Karo. <laughs> how's, how's it helping you right now? Your grand grandfather is the greatest, and you are the worst. It's not for who's better. It's not, it's not the reason. Hashem wanted to protect the Jewish nation that it won't disappear from the face of the earth. If more Jews will marry and more and more and more after 10, 20, 30 generations, that's it. Nothing will be left. We were very close to it. There were one point before the Holocaust that the number of the Jews in the world were, who knows how much, the lowest number ever. How many Jews yet? The lowest number. Half a million. That's it. In the whole world. I mean, the world didn't have 8 billion people. I don't think they even had 1 billion people at that time. But there were only half a million Jews in the whole world. When? Before the Holocaust, way before. I have a chart. It shows you in every generation, after every massive disaster and pogrom, what was the reduction of the Jews that year in the world? Like first temple, second temple, this one, that one, this one. After the Holocaust, the Holocaust, according to that chart, there were 18 million Jews in the world. After the Holocaust, it dropped to 12 million. What about before, rabbinically, before they changed the religion to the mother and they had it with the father? Do you think back then the population would have... I mean, if, if they brought it back to the fathers, don't you think the population of Judaism will grow? I feel like when, when they change it to the mother... It's not relevant. First of all, you can never tell the religion unless you follow the mother. Because how do you know who the father is? Anyone in the world can swear that his father is his father? No. Unless you're mamash like a twin of your father. Twin. That people get confused who is who. Okay, now obviously is his, is his son. But if you don't look exactly like your father, can you hold the Torah and swear that this is your father? There's no way to know. You can swear 100% who your mother is, because everyone saw where you came from. You cannot fake such thing. But according to the Torah, it was based on the father. No. Well, it was always the, no, Mapito. It was always following the mother. It's a pasuk in the Torah. Ki asiret bin Chama Chavai. It's a pasuk in the Torah. So uh, that's what interesting about the Muslims that they follow the father. But how do you know who the father is? Fatma comes. Fatma, what happened? How are you pregnant? God came to me in a dream and made me pregnant. Fatma wasn't like Mary. Mary made up a story. Fatma have a different story. One person raped me last night. Not last night, three months ago, because now you see her stomach. Three months, ah, Ahmed, don't kill me, please. What happened? Three months ago, I walked in a market. Someone came from behind, choked me, and raped me. Tov, okay, Fatma, relax. Why should we kill you? You were raped, it's not your fault. But uh, who is this kid? How are you going to call your son? Uh, well, let's call him Mustafa. Talk, Mustafa, come to the world. Mustafa, what are you? <laughs> maybe Muslim, maybe Christian, maybe Hindu, maybe Jewish. <laughs> what do we have no way to know. Look how silly. He don't know who the father, so there's no religion to the kid. Did you get it or no? It's ridiculous. So Rabotai, Esther, how she agreed? That's the question I'm asking. How Esther agreed to go to the palace? Kill me. I don't go. Yesterday I talked about the story of Sulika, Holy Sulika from Morocco. The king wanted her for his son. The son liked her. She was a very pretty Jewish girl in Morocco. 
No matter what they did, she refused. In the end, they tortured her to death. And she has a grave in Morocco. Beautiful site, white, nice. Someone sent me a video from there. And the Muslims every day come to pray by her grave. They know to appreciate a Jewish tzaddik, at least in Morocco. In Syria, you have a lot of Jewish tzaddikim, big, huge rabbis buried in Syria, huge. One of them, maybe perhaps the biggest one, is Rabbi Chaim Vital, the main student of the Ariya Kadosh. The whole Kabbalah in the world came from him. Without him, no one would know what Kabbalah is today, no one. It's Rabbi Chaim Vital, the Ariya Kadosh said, I was sent to the world to pass the secrets of Kabbalah to you. That was the whole reason why I came to the world. And he's buried in Syria with other Chachamim. They were of Kaduri, Alav Shalom. He went with few rabbis to Syria. And I want to remind you, Syria is an enemy country. We bomb them every, every day, we bomb them. They, together with Iran, they seek for the destruction of Israel. We had few wars with them. As this is one of the biggest enemies we have in the world, Assad, the dictator that poisoned half a million of his own people with gas, welcomed the rabbis to Syria, gave them respect of kings, and let them go to the graves to pray. While we are in a war with Syria. Then there is a group of Syrian Jews right here from Flatbush, Halabim. I think it was about 12. You know, wealthy people that have... Uh, connections in a community, they decided to go to the Jewish cemetery in Syria. That's where their parents came from. The Syrians, the Chalabim, Damascus, Syria. They went, I saw the picture. They sit together with Assad, and they told Assad, thank you for allowing us to come to pray in the graves of our fathers and rabbis. We would like to contribute a large, generous donation to restore the, the cemetery, the Jewish cemetery. You know, things are broken, nobody took care of it for decades. We would like to restore the roads, cut some trees, make some paths, better gates, you know, things are broken over there, to clean. We would like to give money for that. You know what Astrid told them? You're embarrassing me for even saying such thing. This is my obligation. These Chachamim, you know, in Arabic, how do you call a rabbi? Chacham. The Arabs, the Muslim, they call the rabbi Chacham. So they, uh, they say to them, that's my obligation. This Chacham lived here in my country. I have to give them respect. You want to pay for it? It's an insult for us. We will do everything and we will be honored to pay. Go say it to a liberal Jew. So you want to restore the, sin the cemetery of the rabbis? How about we make a road on it? A highway. That's what the garbage liberal would tell you. So you come to someone who poisoned half a million people. <laughs> it's not exactly a tzaddik, you know, in, in case he didn't get the point. But when he heard Chachamim, Fadal, ala eni wa ala rasi. That's what he said. Same thing, Mubarak. Mubarak took the place of Anwar Sadat, who took the place of Nazir, another Hitler. Sadat supposedly made peace with Israel, tricked us really good, <laughs> gave them half, more than half of Israel went to them, land. There was no, really no peace with them. There was no peace. Nobody hates us more than the Egyptians. There's 80 million Egyptians. N every one of them is a pure Nazi. Cannot find one Egyptian that like Jews. Not one in 80 million. They are the biggest haters. What did they lose? Let's fool these stupid Israelis. Tell them, let's make peace. <laughs> we get back all the land. What do we give them? We give them nothing. Nothing is going to change. They gave nothing, and they got everything. Palestinians gave nothing, got everything. Jordanians gave nothing, got everything. That's how they fool us. When you deal with Zionist, communist morons who have no connection to Hashem, they constantly will be fools by this Arab. 
Because the Arab knows who they deal with, with these European stupid Jews, who has no connection to Hashem. They think that by surrendering to the Arabs and giving them gifts, they would like us. They don't understand that the Arabs look at that, look at that as a weakness, an opportunity to destroy us more. They don't understand the Middle Eastern concept. They think with civilized countries, let's make peace. I'll give you this, and you stop attacking me. Okay, let's shake hands. Case closed. That's it. No more wars. I don't get the point. Anyway, someone tell Rav Ovadia Yosef that the Egyptians decided to make a highway, a big highway in Egypt, and the highway will go over the Jewish cemetery. They have no choice. There's buildings. The highway has to go. They have to knock down the cemetery, meaning make the, on the graves make the highway. Rav Ovadia Yosef had such thing. He used to be the chief rabbi of, of uh, Egypt. He got on a plane, immediately flew to meet Mubarak. He called Arya Deri, the head of Shas. He was in the Knesset until today is there. Please use your connection to make me a meeting with Husni Mubarak. Husni Mubarak heard that the chief rabbi, the Chacham, that used to be a rabbi in Cairo, he wants to come to to meet me, right away he approved the meeting. Rav Ovadia went there, he spoke to him in Arabic. Rav Ovadia was born where? Iraq. So he spoke to him in Arabic. He told him, God forbid, think about it. Your, your grandfather is buried somewhere and someone's going to make a highway on his grave and people will drive. How can you live with such thing? Especially when they're holy people and these. Mubarak told him, Rabbi, I understand exactly what you say, but you don't understand what the damage it's going to become for us. We're going to have to lose billions if we have to change the path of this highway. There's really no, not that many options. It's going to have to be a lot longer. People will have to travel a lot longer. It's going to be a big circle. This one cutting right through. It will save Billions of drivers, so much time in the highway. But for your honor, the Chacham of the Yahud, I will see what I can do. I will make them change the path of the highway. And the Rabbi told him, if you do that, I give you a blessing that you live long life, and those who want to defeat you will never succeed. <laughs> That's like that. Then the Muslim brothers, which is Hamas, made a revolution in Egypt with the help of Facebook, with the help of Hussein Obama. Hussein against Husni. <laughs> Hussein is a leopard. You know how the leopard changed the color? If it goes on the land, it becomes brown. It climbs on a tree, dark brown. Goes on the leaves, become green. <laughs> Hussein Obama is like that. He is a friend with Mubarak. Now he heard two million Arabs are in the center of Cairo. That's too late. Mubarak is falling. Right away, he called the Muslim brother. Kif Halak, brothers. How are you today? Who is this? Your brother Hussein. Let's talk how we pass the government into your hand. Immediately stuck a knife. To his ally, Mubarak and him are allies. Egypt and he received money from America. He sold Mubarak right away, and the Muslim brother took over, put Mubarak in jail with his sons. They made in a, 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 a court case against him that there was no doubt to anyone in Egypt that soon they're going to see him hanged with his son in the center of town. That was the talk in Egypt. Every per not one person gave him a chance to come out of it. Embezzle money, corruption, killing a a people in demonstration, a murder, corruption, stealing, robbing. What a court case. That's it. There's no chance to come out of it without death penalty. <laughs> and all, all, against all odds, the bracha of Chacham Ovadia. <laughs> Got him out in the end free. No punishment, nothing.
Nobody understand how did it happen. They let him die. He was already an old man. Later slept in his house, no jail, no nothing. And until he died. For that respect that he gave, not to destroy the Jewish cemetery over there. I have a cousin in Israel, he's a judge in a court. Not anymore, he quit. He is a secular guy, but he was, he's honest, like, you know, straight like a ruler. Very, very straight. That's his nature, very, very straight. So when he was a judge in Haifa, Haifa is one of the largest cities in Israel, he was very honored. The, you know, the lawyers, they give marks to the judges based on performance in a courtroom. They come ready, they know the material, they're not confused, they remember the last, the last meeting in a court. Some judges are drug addicts. Smoke guy, hey, what's up? What's your name? Remind me, you know me for 20 years. What do you mean, what's my name? So, you know, we have judges like this. They don't know, what, what are we dealing here with today? That's the murder case. Oh, murder case. I was talking about a different case. Give me five minutes. I need a bathroom break. They don't know what's going on, but he was professional. One time, my aunt is telling me, tomorrow he has a court case, about 20 Hasidim, they were arrested for demonstrating in Bet Shemesh somewhere, or in Haifa, I don't know exactly, somewhere in the north. They were demonstrating because the Israelis, they want to make a road, and while they were making a road, they found graves. Star David on a, on, a, on a marble there. It was a cemetery, an ancient cemetery from hundreds of years ago. They discovered it while they were making an underpass. So right away, the Hasidim, they, you know, they zealous to Hashem. They came, they started to scream. They demonstrate, they beat them up. The police, get out of here. No, what, what do you mean? The tractor is going to destroy the graves. So they arrest them. And he has to now decide if they remain in jail or they can go out and bail. Or if, there's, if maybe there's no case, he can dismiss the case. So she tells me uh, he's going to be the judge in this case. Right away, I contacted him. I told him, I just want you one tomorrow when you make a decision, when this Hasidim come. I know you hear the media and everyone brainwash the secular people against the religious orthodox. I just want to remind you one thing. Your father passed. Your father is his grave. Imagine now a tractor decided to make a highway on your father's head. It's going to be in our road. Everybody drive with his car on your father's grave. Like one, two, three, ten, twenty, fifty, a hundred million cars every week will drive on your father's grave. And a bunch of Hasidim out of nowhere showed up, lay there, get beaten up, they break their bones, throw things on them, arrest them, torture them, wants them to be in jail for what? For living their comfortable life and coming in a heat to a place to try to stop this crime of making a road on the graves of holy people. Just think. Someone like that deserve a prize or deserve a punishment? He's very, very calculated. I hear you. I hear you. One word. I hear you. The next day on the news, the leftists are in shock. Judge decided to dismiss the case. Or if they only knew I'm behind it, oh, wow. my problems with them would start 10 years earlier. They only came to me after this lousy trader prime minister came after me. This was 10 years before or more even. But in the end, he saw for his own eyes that it's all so corrupted. And he went back to be a lawyer. He was making more than 10 times more as a lawyer. Why you have an office, you're a lawyer, you make so much money, you are a prestige lawyer, you have lots of customers. Why would you want to close your office and go to be a judge in a court for 90% less salary? The answer, honor, ego, respect. Now there's a conflict between two desires that human being has. 
One, desire for honor, people to bow down to me, to acknowledge me, to recognize me, to love me, to admire me, to praise me, to compliment me, to, you know, to admire my wisdom, whatever, everyone with his dream. And then there is another desire, greed, money. I want to occupy the whole world. What happened with two desires that you have collides with each other? You can eat both, either this or that. If you're going to follow the desire for honor, you're going to lose millions of dollars in your career. If you follow your desire for money, you're going to get zero respect. You're just going to be a lawyer. Lawyers don't get any respect. You're not going to be, oh, your honor, your honor. So that's how you know which one of the desires are stronger. Some people, the greed and love for money is so huge that they're willing to be embarrassed everywhere and have terrible articles about them and people spit at them in the street and people hate them. They are cruel landlords torturing the tenants. Their face is in a newspaper every day as long as they make millions. They don't care. People spit at them. People wish them to die. They don't care. Why? They don't have so much ego. Eh, big deal. They curse me. Let them curse. I make a million dollars a week. Some people, their honor is so important for any amount of money, they won't want to compromise it. So as much as they love money, they love the reputation a million times more. So they're willing to give any amount of money to some reporter not to publish a bad article about them. I'll give you $10 million. Please bury it. Don't, let, don't make it see air. Why? I rather lose a lot of money than not to that people look at me in a negative way. So depend. Depend. He apparently his ego and honor and the will to control overcame by far his desire for money. Until today, he's not such a greedy person. He lives comfortable. He lives. He drive a normal car. Nothing to show off. But some people, their love for money is so huge, <laughs> they'll never agree to be a judge. Why would I be a judge? I make 10 times more here. Same thing with athletes. You have athletes in Israel, soccer players. They also have this dilemma. One, they have greed for money. They want to make a lot of money. They're young, in their 20s. They're not going to play forever. By age 35, they're done. They have between age 18 to 35, that's it. The rest of their life, they're not going to be employed. They want to make a lot of money. So in Israel, how much they can make? 100, 200,000 dollars a year. It's not such a big league. They want to go to Europe. In Europe, they can make 5 million a year, 10 million a year, a lot more, 20 times more. But in Europe, they never play. They're all usually a bunch of losers. One out of 100 maybe was a good player, meaning that he can play in Europe because the Europeans are very strong in soccer. So he's going to Europe. He will play a game or two the whole season. He will sit on the bench, no one will know where he is, everyone in Israel will forget him. Wow, but he makes 10 million a year. In Israel he made a million a year, now he makes 10 million a year. Five, six seasons is going to be in Europe, come to Israel with 50, 60 million dollars. And now he's going to start getting some acknowledgement after he made so much money. But some players they don't want, they want the fame. They walk in the street, everyone comes, selfie, Moshe, wow, I'm your biggest fan. It doesn't matter, he, won't, he will be broke. But everyone in Israel would, would scream when they see him on the street, Tata, wow, what a goal you scored. They're looking for honor. But they offer you ten times more money. They don't want. Why they don't want? Their ego overcome the greed for money. You got it? So, after we clarify this, I want to ask you now, why Esther agreed to go? She should say to them, right away, I'm Jewish. I'm not allowed to be with a non-Jewish man. Sorry, it's against my religion. Respect it. One chance they will tell her, okay, we respect it. We won't tell the king about you. Or they'll get angry. We're offering you to be the queen and you're giving us this garbage, that you're religious? 
will make you, I don't know, Muslim, whatever he was, there's no Islam. Islam is only 1300 years old. Whatever Achashverosh was. You will follow your husband's religion. Or they'll say, if you won't agree, we will execute you. We'll throw you out of the window. That's the worst can happen, right? One, either they let her go. Two, they will take her by force. You have to be what your husband is. He's not Jewish, and you're going to be not Jewish. That's it. Or if she refuses, they'll kill her. No big deal. She'll die and go to heaven. What's the problem? Isn't it the law that if they tell a Jew to worship any idol, he has to die and not to agree? He has to die to give his life. So why Esther didn't give her life? Now we're going to learn an important difference between a Jewish man and a Jewish woman. A, diff a, a big difference. They bring Esther to the palace. Five years she's there. She doesn't say that she's Jewish. And no one betray her. There were no lefty traders. You didn't have Chuck Schumer, Bernie Sanders, and 75% of American Jews that betray Israel and betray Judaism. Remember what Trump said? When was it? Yesterday? What I've been saying for more than 20 years. You know how many people send me the clip about Trump today? You have no idea how many. I don't know, maybe a hundred at least. Everybody send it to me. You've been saying it for years. What's the chidush? Every Jew who votes Democrat is a criminal. I've been saying it for years. That's nothing new. He's a traitor. Betray his own nation, betray Israel, betray God, betray Judaism, and betray morality. Support abortion, support helping to terrorists, support illegal immigration, support robbing the, 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 the rich and giving to lousy bums to do nothing with their life. Everything about Democrats is negative. Everything. Don't get me wrong, not that the Republicans are such big tzaddikim, you know. We're not talking about the Baba Sali here and, uh, and the Ben Ishchai here. But they're not as bad. That's already a big thing. They're not as bad. Both bad. But Republicans are half as bad. That's already an achievement. What would you like, someone to rob you for a million dollars or half a million? You have to choose one of the two robbers. You have Tony and you have Vinny. They're all with a gun pretending a robbery now. They ask you, hey, by the way, I can talk to them. He, he needs a million, he needs half a million. I'll direct the one with a million to your neighbor. How much you give me? I'll give you 5,000 bucks. Send uh, Vinny, half a million. Okay, I'll live with that. Since when you request a robber come into your house and rob you? You don't want it. But what's the alternative? To lose a million. <laughs> you just got away with half a million. Got the point? What's the alternative? Republicans are better than nothing. Much better to fall in the hands of the, of the Democrats. So what did he say? He said everyone who votes Democrats, a Jew, is betraying God, betraying the state of Israel. It's not a, betraying Judaism. Clearly he said that. He's right. He's right, he's right. Is it going to make a change? No, they will do on purpose the opposite. They commit suicide. They'll see Israel go on flame, they'll still vote Democrats. They see all the Nazis in a Demo Democratic Party, all these Walid, Shalit, Balit, all these Muslim Nazis that once genocide in Israel and are so happy about October 7. And the Jews will still vote for them. How can you vote for them? Is it not normal? They want to put you in the gas chambers. They want to chop your head off. They want to burn your life. They want to steal the land that God gave to your fathers. How would you vote for someone who called for your death? The answer, when you are a self-hated Jew and a traitor and a lefty, everything is possible. Everything is possible. Instead of coming and saying, Trump, as much as I don't like your style, but you're right. We made mistakes. It's time to change. You don't want to vote Republican? Don't vote at all. 
Rabbi, can I ask you a question? No, no, we don't know. I don't want to go to politics. I just no, no mentioned politics. it, by the way, by no the way. Politics. So the question is, Rabotai, Esther is five years in the palace and no one, no one came to Achashverosh to tell him, you know, your wife is Jewish. Now one Jew, do you know what connection you're going to have with the king of 127 countries? Imagine you come to Achashverosh, hi, can I speak to the king? Who are you? My name is Itzhak. Itzhak Cohen. No? Why you want to speak to the king? Who exactly you are? I have information that once the king finds out what I'm about to tell him, he's going to kiss me a million kisses. I promise you I'm going to be his hero. Don't worry. If you don't like what I'm about to tell the king, kill me. You get curious. Okay, King Achashverosh, right away, bring, bring that Yitzchak coin quickly. Let's see what he has to say. He comes in, your majesty, you like your new queen, right? She refused to tell you where she's from. You know why? I went to school with her. She's Jewish. Ma? She's Jewish and she's not telling me? You have a special card. Any problem you have? You are a friend of the king. Not one person sold there. No one. Remember, it's before they realize they're about to die. <laughs> nobody, nobody sold there. How long it would be today that they'll sell you on the media? Less than a minute. As soon as she arrived to the palace, it will be all over Facebook. <laughs> Breaking news! The rumors, the king replaced his queen, that pretty one, he wiped her out and brought a new queen. Who is this lovely queen? Anyone who has information about her, please call 1-800. A reward will be given. Thousands of people will call, hey, we know her. She's from here, she's from there, her father, her mother, nobody sold her. Five years. And Esther Magedet Amau Meladeta. But we still have the question, why she didn't want to die on Kiddush Hashem? Kill me. I'm not going to be with, the, with this king. The answer, Rabotai, Esther has to have intimacy with the Hashverosh. It's not every day, because he has other wives. How does he choose them? They walk in the garden. And he has a stick. He looks. Who is he in the mood? Fatma. Well, Fatma touched the stick. Fatma has a meeting with him tonight. So basically the relationship between the king and the queen was nothing but intimacy, nothing else. Do you think you have time to talk to them? <laughs> Meaning they have to beg to be with the king that they can go and brag. The king chose me. That's basically it. So she can hide. Don't come in the garden. Five years, he won't see you. Right or wrong? That was the plan. She did hide. Except when Mordechai told her, it's going to be a holocaust. Hashem put you here. You must save us. If you won't save us, someone else will. But you will be judged with your future forever for having an opportunity to save us from a holocaust and you didn't do it. I don't get it. Mordechai is a big rabbi, big chacham. He suggests that the Jewish girl from Bet Yaakov Yeshiva would want to go with this drunk terrorist and be intimate with him in order for her to save the Jewish nation from that? Is this allowed or no? Pikuach Nefesh allowed such thing? If someone wants to kill 10 Jews, unless we give, her a, we give them a Jewish girl, that they can take her and do horrible things to her. And if we will give her the girl, they won't kill the ten brothers or neighbors or whatever. We're allowed to give her? No. So what's the question here? It's a good question, Rabotai. But it's different between a man and a woman. Yes. A woman is compared to the land of the world. The land of the world is not, it's static, it's not moving, right? It's stuck and it's there and that's it. In intimacy, 
A woman that is not interested, she doesn't move, she, fr she freezes, she doesn't cooperate. Someone is taking advantage on her. If you connect her now to a lie detector, she, they will ask her, did you want it? She said, no, it was the worst minute of my life. I would rather die than be there. So why didn't you kill yourself? I didn't have the guts. I was afraid to kill myself. You need to be, to, to be brave. Well, to, to jump from the window? What, what should I do? Should I burn myself? Should I drink pills? What should I have done? You're right, I should have killed myself, but I was afraid. Now, thinking about what happened to me, I would rather be dead before it happened. But in the middle of the rape, she didn't want. So she doesn't cooperate. A man cannot be intimate with a woman without being active. This is the way Hashem designed the world. You know, in a kosher intimacy, the woman is laying with her face up and the man with his face down. Why did Hashem design it like this? The Gemara say because everyone in a time of intimacy is the highest moment of connection. There are moments of connection between men and a woman. One is when they look at each other's eyes. It's already make a connection. That's why you're not supposed to look at women's eyes. She's not your wife, not supposed to look at her. Go to the supermarket and look at her eyes. What is this? It's already a connection. Then physical connection, like handshake, hugs, all these things. Then kisses. It creates unity between the two people. And intimacy, the highest, the highest form of connection. The highest form of connection. So now, in a moment which is the highest form of connection between a male and a female, Hashem wanted each one of them to be connected also to the source of their creation. A man looks down to the ground, where that's where he was created from. Vayitzer Hashem Elokim et Adam afar min Adama. God created Adam sent from the ground. So a man is facing down. And a woman face up to his rib. That's where she came from. So she has connection to where she was created from. And he has a connection to where he was created from. But there's one difference between man and a woman. A man is an occupier, he's occupying, he's an activist. He cannot be static and have intimacy, it's not possible. But a woman can be static, can be disgusted, can even cry, can faint even. She's suffering right now, what? But she doesn't move. Since she doesn't move and she's not cooperating, is not in the same league of a scene of someone who goes with a woman that is forbidden to him and is active to do it. It's called that he's doing peula, asiyah. A woman is sheve al taase. She doesn't do anything. Yes, she eventually indirectly participating right now in the scene. But she is first not interested in it. Second, she does it for the sake of saving life of thousand. And third, if she wouldn't agree, they'll kill her anyway. And they kill the Jews. It's not that if she does it, if she refuses, they will kill only her. No, they'll kill her and they'll kill the Jews. You didn't get anything by that. Okay. So now, Rabotai, when we understand a little bit the calculation over here, the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin say, Esther Karka Ola Maita. The Gemara explained that in one, one sentence. Esther is like the land of the world, meaning static. She doesn't have to move. Like the land doesn't move, she doesn't move. Top. The Rama, the chief rabbi of all the Ashkenazim in the last 500 years. He wrote his commentary on the Shulchan Aruch. Rabbi Moshe Iserlish. He lived short life, 33 years. In 33 years, people were the biggest Chachamim in the world. 33 years. What is uh, Today, someone 33 years, how much Torah he knows? The Ramchal, 38 years old, wrote more than 100 books. And level of an angel. The Gaon Mivilna. All these people, when they were already in their 30s, they were giants. Orach Haim HaKadosh. All these people, in a very young age, they already knew the whole Torah. Rav Nachman Mibreslev, 39. A lot of the Chachamim didn't even make it to 40. The Ari HaKadosh. 
less than 40. How do they do it? How to believe? One of the explanations is that their souls were in a much higher level than ours. They were capable of receiving a lot more. But there's another reason. The world was not a dirty place like it is now. They didn't have to come in contact with any filthy people or not modest women or, you know, the culture that we have today. There was no internet, no screens everywhere, temptation that the world has today. It was all very simple life. People make their own food. Everyone has few roosters and chickens in a backyard with a goat or two. They make their own cheese. They make their own meat. And that was it. The chicken gives you eggs, so you eat eggs. You eat a little bit meat, you eat chicken, you eat fish that you catch, that's it. You live in a simple house, there's no electric, there's nothing to see on your phone when you're bored. <coughs> Once garbage doesn't go in, only holiness goes in, it's like a snowball, because it's pure. The problem with us is a lot of good things go in and then comes one bad things and destroy everything. You learn 10 hours today, Torah, you walk in the street, you come out of the yeshiva, women walks, no clothes, no nothing, screens everywhere, you look, wow, what a picture, wow, what a car. What? <coughs> right away, the poison penetrates. So your head is a basket full of garbage and full of Torah mixed. I don't have to tell you what happened when you spill on a Sefer Torah some coffee. What happened to it? So that's really the problem. The problem is that even children, you send them to good yeshiva, and then you give them those iPads to watch all kinds of things. Oh, what am I letting them watch? It's a discovery channel, Rabbi. It's animals. Look how beautiful the zebra, Rabbi. They don't like elephants. Look, elephants, horse, shark. What can be bad? I want them to fall in love with Hashem. Doesn't the Rambam say that the more you look at the creation, the more you fall in love with God? She is such a good lawyer, this woman. Huh? Look how she convinced the rabbi in two minutes that it's mitzvah to give the kids discovery channel. Until you listen to the background explanation. 300 million years ago. <laughs> That's it. Poison, venom went into the mind of this Jewish pure kid. Fifteen years later, he will become Santa Claus, or the clown from Englewood, or the clown from London, one of these Reshaim Arurim. Where, how they became so evil and so wicked and such Machtiya Rabin. The garbage that went into their system, usually from college, corrupted their mind. It's not that they didn't learn Torah. They learned Torah, they were in yeshivot, no? Most of them were born religious, they're not Baalei Tshuva. So there were X amount of years that they learned Torah somewhere. How they became such enemies of God? Worse than any Christian, worse than any Muslim, worse than any Hindu even. How did they become people that destroyed the world? Every one of those in my black list. How they became like that? The garbage that went into the red. The clown from Englewood had the urge to write a book about culture, you know what? Err, oh, ah, it was such an achievement to write a filthy book like this. Why, the Goim ran, how oh, can we invite you to a talk show? Michael Jackson bought him a house in Englewood. That's the rumor. That's what they say. If it's true or not, I don't know. Since when a pedophile rhyme to buy a house to a rabbi? Connect. <laughs> Why? What's going on? And where is the house? Next door to Gaddafi, the mass murderer. You know Gaddafi, the dictator of Libya? That was raped by his own people? He had the worst debt you can imagine, the worst. They have a mutual land. Oy la rasha, oy le shcheno. But here I'm not sure which one is more wicked. This one or that one? The Jew or the Goy? I'm not so sure. I'm actually sure, but better not to go into it. <laughs> so let's, let's move on. The Ramah, he writes in a different language a little bit. 
He say, if a woman is being attacked, she's not agreeing to the relationship. She has no obligation to give her life to die. She doesn't have this obligation. If a man is forced to commit a sin of Giloy Arayot, have intimacy with this woman or we kill you. You know, it's not allowed. He has to die. Because he cannot have intimacy without being active. But by a woman, no. You force her, she doesn't want. You force her. She's Anusa. Anus Rachmana Patri. But here it's even more lenient. This is a one individual woman that I want to take advantage on her. Here it's not, she's not even doing it for herself. She has only one thing in mind. How do I save my nation from the Holocaust? Millions will die. And which kind of millions? All of them religious. All Shomrei Shabbat. Not like today, 80% Mechalele Shabbat, haters of God, all kinds of people that we have in our nation, unfortunately. That according to the Torah, anyway, they don't deserve to live because they break Shabbat every week. Mechalel Shabbat, Mot Yumat. Some of them are idol worshippers, some of them are gays, some of them are murderers, some of them are pedophiles, some of them are murderers, some of them are huge thieves. Some of them do chilul Hashem every second of their life in their job. Some of them are Muslim and apikorsim and haters of Torah, promoting abomination, making disaster movies in Hollywood, destroying economy of the country with their greed. These people definitely don't deserve to breathe, but Hashem keeps them for, for the time being, until He will start giving them what they deserve. But here it wasn't the case. Everyone was a tzaddik. Every woman was modest. Every man was a learner of Torah. Everyone had yamaka and tzitzit and ate strictly kosher. This is how Amman described the Jews to Achashverosh. They're all different, they're all religious, they have different religious, different language, they don't mix with us, they don't look like us, they don't want to get anything to do with us, they're not loyal to our culture and to our country, they're not productive, all day they learn Torah, what do you need them, they don't even pay taxes, and the few of them that pay taxes, it's on me, tell me how much you're going to lose by killing them, whatever income you had from those few Jews who work, I cover. That's how he presented his case. Meaning almost nobody was almost nobody was a businessman. Definitely not a criminal. To save millions of tzaddikim like this, she's willing to sacrifice a lot more than her life. If you ask a woman what would you rather, being raped or being killed? Most of them, 99% will say being killed. Shoot me quickly in the head that I don't have to go through this nightmare. Because the rape is not just the rape. It's 20 years after. Non-stop suffering. So Esther say, I'm willing to give my life. You know, they say the one student caught the gown Mivilna by surprise, learning Gemara and Tisha B'Av. And I allowed to learn Torah and Tisha B'Av. You have to learn things of mornings, sad things. Why the Torah makes you very happy. Pikudei Hashem Yesharim Mesamchei Lev. Making the heart joy, joy and happiness. And in a day that the temple was destroyed and millions of Jews were murdered, the last thing you want is happiness and joy. Now it's time to cry, to sit on the floor and cry and fast. So we're not supposed to learn the usual Gemara that we learn every day, no. So someone caught the Gaon Mivina learning Gemara. Rabbi, you're breaking the law. Gaon Mivina, the biggest rabbi in the world, the holiest person in the whole world. He's learning, hiding and learning Gemara. I don't know if this story really happened or not. You know, some stories you have to check if they're reliable or not. But I always tell people when they ask me, do you believe that that story really happened? I have a great answer to those who question the story. You know what I say? If it happens or not, I don't know, I wasn't there. But one thing I can tell you, no one tells stories like this about me and you. You get the point or no? Someone comes and says, you know what, the, I read in a book of the Babasali, they're crazy with their nonsense, they're exaggerating. The Babasali told the Arab driver, 
go over there, you're going to find a lake, bring water and put in a radiator. How the Baba Zali knew in the Sahara Desert that there is some lake somewhere? Uh, don't you see that he has a holy vision? And the driver put a stick with a t-shirt on the road that on the way back, he's going to look for that stick that he can go take a nice shower and drink some water. The Baba Zali... And when the driver came back, there was no lake. Sounds like a fairy tale. So one person told me, you really believe this nonsense? People make up stories. The answer, yes, some people make up stories. People are people. Some are making fake stories. Maybe they have good intention. Why did you make up that fake story? To inspire the kids to be like the Baba Sali, holy. It gives inspiration, but that's very dangerous. Because if one day these kids will find out that some of the stories are not real, then they'll begin to question the stories that are written in a book of God directly, in the Torah. Oh, how do I know that the Red Sea split? They have difficult time to, uh, to adjust, to adapt the stories of the Torah. How do I know manna was falling from heaven every day? You believe such thing? You believe that it will be the resurrection of the dead? Rabbi, come on. You look to me intelligent. You speak about Torah and science. No, science. Science said that a person that 500 years in the grave can come back to life. Come on. Rabbi, you're not those primitive ones, you know. You have a nice tie. You really believe someone will come out of a grave after 500 years is dead? Why is he talking like this? Because he's academic. Because he's used logic. Logically, nobody comes out of the grave. It's a fact. What's wrong with what he said? Nothing is wrong. What's wrong with him? That he did not understand that when God wants something to happen, the laws of nature is definitely not an obstacle for him. As you can see at least a hundred times in the Torah. So what are you suggesting? That God is a liar? that he wrote in his Torah that he split the Red Sea and the Jewish nation went through and the Egyptian drowned. You have either in one option to believe what's happened, because God said so, or to say, I don't believe that it happened because God is lying. There's no in between. It's either this or that. When you tell people fairy tales, that caused the indirect damage that later they become infidels. Infidels. So I say to people, if it happened or not, I don't know. I mean, can I swear on my life that it happened? No. Some happened, some didn't happen. But nobody writes a book that I drove with the Arab driver in the desert, and I told the Arab, go, and you're going to see a lake over there, and out of nowhere, I actually created that lake, because on the way back, there was no lake. The stick was there with the shirt, but then there was no water. You get the point or no? Anyone would write about us a story like this one day? Something inside me tell me that it's not going to be the case. <laughs> you, you don't know. So, Rabotai. Why was he learning Gemara? So, the Kod de Gaon Mivilna is learning uh, Gemara, and the student told him, Rabbi, you're learning Gemara? And the Rabbi told him, I know that I'm going to hell for that. But it's worth it for me. Not to lose a day, a year of learning and go to hell for that. I'm willing to take the suffering. <laughs> Meaning his love for the Torah was so huge, his addiction to Torah was so big, that they come to a drug addict, they say, if you're going to touch this drug right now, you're going to jail for a month of suffering. And he'll still do the drug. Are you normal? One month of suffering with all kinds of who knows what. Why did you touch? I can't help it. I can't. I just cannot resist it. So imagine if someone is such an addict of Torah. And one second he cannot stop learning. Or like Ben Azai. The Gemara said Ben Azai was teaching Shiur. And he said to his student, a person is not allowed to be without a woman. 
He must do everything he can from age 18. Today it's a little bit later, 20, 22, okay, but from a very young age, to get married and to have kids. The student knew that he's already much older and he has no intention to ever get married. He's not going on dates. Everyone ask him, Rabbi, Ben Azai, we have a great religious girl for you. No, no, I'm not open for shiduchim. They ask him, Rabbi, na'e doresh, na'e mekayem. It's not enough just to give nice, nice speeches. You have to live by what you preach. It's easy to talk, much harder to keep. So the rabbi answered them, you're right. What can I answer? Chashka nafshi batora. My soul is addicted to the Torah. I cannot go five minutes without Torah. I'll be destroyed. Someone like me can never be a husband. Can definitely not be a father of kids and raise them. Cannot be a person that can live in a family. Why? Because all day I have to be in learning. Cannot stop. So how can I entertain my wife? How can I give her attention? How can I give her love? I can, how can I even be with her? How? I, I don't want to waste a minute on food a day. You expect me to be with a woman and she's sad now, she's crying, she needs support. It's not fair. Now the Gemara has a discussion about this. Does he have a case or no? Because it's written in the Torah. First mitzvah to get married and have kids. With all due respect to you, Mr. Dear Rabbi Ben Azai, the, the mitzvot of the Torah applies to you as well. Right? But there is such a concept that someone that is forced is unable and handicapped. Let someone doesn't have hands. He cannot put fill in. You know, he cannot come and say to him, he's such a criminal, you never put fill in. You're normal. I was born without hands. How can I put fill in? God gives him reward like he put fill in because he knows he's suffering every day in a shul when he see people put fill in and doesn't have hands. You get the point or no? So he cannot do lulav. He doesn't have hands. There are many mitzvot he cannot keep. He is not guilty. He's, uh, he's anus. Anus means you are forced, unable to do. The Gemara says, if someone is in such an addiction to Torah, like this Rabbi Ben Azai, will he be freed and his punishment will be cancelled and dismissed or no? The answer is yes. The Gemara says, but from now on, no one is in the level of Ben Azai. From now on, no one will be able to make such a claim. How the Chachamim knew? Every Chacham knew all the other Chachamim. And no one was in such a level like him. No one. So the Chachamim say he's an exceptional student. Exceptional. No one can reach such level. So he is the only one that can use this claim. It's Anus. Just like someone doesn't have hands, he cannot put fill in. Someone who doesn't have money, can he give tzedakah? Yes or no? He doesn't have a penny to his name. His balance is negative. He wants to give now on Purim matanot laevionim. His rabbi told him, excuse me, in case you didn't understand, you are an avion. Supposed to receive gifts. After you receive, you also give. But right now, you have no, there's no claim against you. You cannot give tzedakah. True or false? You said you get other people to give. Wow, you ruined my lecture. It's not fair. Ma. You're not supposed to tell. It's like someone who watch a movie and tell them what's happening now. No, don't worry. You won't die in the end. It's a fake. The, the bullets are not real. You ruined the show. I was just about to say it. The answer is false. Technically, it's true, obviously. If you cannot give, you can give. But you can make other give. 
when you convince someone that has to give, by him giving, it counts in Shamaim, you gave even more than him. Convince your uncle to sponsor a lecture, he sent a thousand dollars. Count in Shamaim that you are the sponsor. He gets full reward. Full reward for sponsoring. But you that gave him the idea and pushed him to do it, you get just as much and even more than him. Can you believe it? That means the poorest people in the world can donate millions of dollars every year. More than the rich. Imagine now, 20 years old, Bachur Yeshiva doesn't have a dollar to his name. Driving his bike, sitting in the shul next to the, the Gvir, the owner of 20 buildings in Manhattan. This guy gave two million dollars to Daka this year, the Gvir. Sits with his tuxedo in a shul. Everyone looks at him in the VIP. The rabbi made him in a place next to him on the stage. Everyone looks. Every other word, the rabbi looks at him. Uh, Mr. X, we owe him so much. He made for us this X extension in the shul. Hashem yevarech oto v'yishmerehu v'chayehu v'bne mishpachto. Half an hour of Shabbat is just praising the, the gvir. And then this, uh, this bachur yeshiva sitting over there, he made other give three million this year. Nobody looks at him. Why do you want to sit in a shul? What do you mean what? I pray here. Come on, leave the seat for the people that help the shul. You stand in the back, you young. Nobody gives him any credit except Hashem. Who gave more tzedakah in the eyes of God? That kid. Even though nothing came out of his pocket. By convincing others to give, he actually got bigger credit than the one who actually gave. What can be more beautiful than this? There's no discrimination. Even poor people can give tons of tzedakah. Why they don't do it? Because they're lazy. Some poor people, they know rich people. But they never talk to them once about helping Kiruv or helping a yeshiva or helping other poor people. They never. So, Rabotai, the Ramah explained a woman doesn't have to get killed. Especially in this case when she's going to save millions from debt, there's no question of it. In Shulchan Aruch it's written, when a person sees that after a scene that he is going to do. I gave the Gaon Mivilna as an example that he was willing to go to hell not to lose a day of learning Torah. If the story really happened, in reality. Question is, can we also follow that concept? I tell you a story. You know, there used to be a singer named Shlomo Karlibach. You heard about him or no? He was a rabbi, officially. And then he became, I think, a singer. He was singing in concert. He was more very popular. Most of the melodies that the Ashkenazim use today when they pray comes from him. He made it. A lot of the singing of Shabbat. He is the composer of the music. But he, close to the end of his life, when he was older already, he had a guitar, he was making concert, and a lot of the people who followed him used to be the hippies, the American hippies of the 70s, Woodstock. He was bringing them closer to Judaism and to Torah through the music, because music is a very spiritual thing. People come, they enjoy his music, he was a good singer. And through that, they starting to show some connection to, Jude to their Judaism, these American Jews. One time he was on a show, I heard it with my own ears. A Hasid from Borough Park called the show. He said to him, can I ask you a question? This is a show, live show. He said, yes. He said, who gave you permission to make such a Chilul Hashem, to play music and women get up and dance in front of your eyes? And not only you don't stop the music and you let them continue to dance, you are holding their hands while they're dancing. 
Where in the world there is permission to do such thing? A woman is not your wife, you're touching her in public? Chilul Hashem. When the Torah allow to do such Chilul Hashem in public? The Hasid were attacking him. He said to the Hasid, I know it's not right. But through my music, I was able to bring a lot of Jews closer to the Torah. And that's the only reason I'm doing it. I don't really need to hold their hand. What I, I mean, I take her on a date or something. She enjoyed the music, she got up, people get spiritual right now. He <laughs> said to him, but where does it say in the Torah that you're allowed to break the rules of the Torah in order for you to bring another Jew closer? If a, if a secular Jew will tell me, Rabbi, if you come to me to McDonald and eat with me cheeseburger, I accept on myself from now on to be Shomer Shabbat. Am I allowed to do it? Big deal! One thing, Hashem knows my intention. I even don't like cheeseburger. Ich, Magil, this burger, full of fat, Magil, pork. I'm disgusted by that. I'm going to suffer for every bite. Not that I desire it, but I'm willing to do it for this Jew to become Shomer Shabbat and save his Olam Abba, saving him from losing eternity. You, might, you may come and say, wow, it's a noble, noble mitzvah. You sacrifice your spirituality for the sake of another Jew to save him from losing his eternity? What can be bigger pikuach nefesh than this? Right or wrong? It's a very logical argument. The answer, the Torah condemned it severely. No permission to even violate rabbinical law to save someone from being mechalel Shabbat. No permission. Gemara say, someone put dough into the oven to bake a cake. How long does it take for the cake to start baking from the top? A minute. After one minute, the first layer of the dough starting to become hard. Meaning if you scrape the top, you can eat it. Then it goes lower and lower and lower until the whole dough become a cake. 20 minutes, an hour, whatever it takes. So he puts it inside the oven. Remember, the ovens of those days were not like ours. It was a big hole with walls like the, the taboon. You know how they put the, the Iraqi pita on a taboon, they stick it? That's how it used to be. If they want to put it in a pan, they have to put it all the way on the charcoals. And the way to pull it out, they have a special stick with a hook. Like in a pizza shop, that they, it's all the way in, they cannot reach. Cannot put the head in the oven. So they have a special baker stick, they pull it out, and then with the gloves they take it out. This is how it used to be. But using that stick to take something out of the oven, it's a rabbinical restriction. Because you're not allowed to bake on Shabbat, therefore the Chachamim made a restriction that all the tools that are being used in a bakery are all mukse. You cannot use it. Why? Because they relate to a forbidden melacha of baking on Shabbat. So now the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat ask, what happened if, you, if your friend put the Mechalel Shabbat, someone you know, your friend, your cousin, he put the cake inside and in one minute he will become Mechalel Shabbat. It's breaking Shabbat. In the first minute, it's not Mechalel Shabbat yet, because it's still a dough. It doesn't deserve to be eaten. But in a minute or two, a part of this dough will become an official cake. From that moment on, he's guilty of death penalty and a permanent cut for the soul. You want to save the life of that Jew from being Mechalel Shabbat, because you know Hashem is going to give him a death penalty one way or the other one day. So you want to use that stick of the bakers, it's called Mardeh, and take the cake out. He left. He's going to come back in half an hour. And then he'll find out that someone took his cake out. You are doing him a favor. This fool wants to bake on Shabbat. But you knowing what's waiting for him, you want to take the cake out and save him from the death penalty. What could be more logical than this? 
It should have been an obligation of every Jew to quickly take the cake out. But because you cannot take the cake out with your hands, you need to use that stick. And the Chachamim made restriction that this stick is mukze, cannot move it on Shabbat. You're not allowed to take the cake out. He will die, he would lose his eternity, it's on him. I do not break rabbinical law to save you from the death penalty, from committing the war sin and of Torah of Chilul Shabbat. En omrim lo le'adam chete kedei shizke chavercha. Bishvil shizke chavercha, you don't. If it would not be written in a Gemara, that would be mandatory. It wouldn't be even a question. No one would even think to ask a rabbi, Rabbi, I'm, allow, I'm allowed to use that stick? That's why the Gemara came and told you, even though it's very logical, to break a rabbinical law, to save a Jew from being Mechalel Shabbat, you're not allowed. After we know that, now we have a question here. If a person knows, like in the case of Esther, if a person knows that he's about to commit a sin, no question about it, it's a sin, it's not allowed, but there will be salvation to the public from this sin. Someone's car. Here you go. Tere mikrau, v'ani ene. You know what it means? Before you finish to ask me to remove the problem, I already answered. It's written, there's a verse. Before you called me, I already sent you the solution. Remember what I said before? Baruch gozerum kayem. Does a person allowed to do such thing or no? You're allowed to do such thing or no? Do you want to break a law now of the Torah? Once you're doing it, <coughs> 500 people will be saved from lots of suffering, from, from a pandemic, from who knows what. I'll give you an example. Is it allowed to steal? Not allowed to steal. Let's say someone has an antidote against some virus. That someone who already got the virus, if you give him that shot, immediately he gets cured in two hours. He gets up from the bed and he is not going to die. And that scientist refused to give it. Refused to give it. I'm sorry, I didn't get paid. It's worth millions. I have 500 here, each one of them worth $1,000. But there are 500 people who are about to die, 500 Jews, they're about to die. Give us the shots. I'm sorry, I'm not giving it to you, it's half a million dollars. You give him one punch to the face, <coughs> knock him out, break the glass of his lab, steal the 500 shots, run with your friends, quickly give 500 shots to the people, and now you save 500 lives. Allowed or not allowed? Not only allowed, it's an obligation. Obligation, pikuach nefesh. What about the stealing? You broke the law of the Torah, you stole. Torah allowed to steal? Not allowed. This is an example of unique cases that you're going to break the law, but not for fun or for the pleasure of the sin. For only one, one reason, to save someone from death, from disaster, to save someone's marriage. For instance, to lie. It's a strict restriction to lie. The Torah is very allergic to liars. Hashem cannot stand liars. But Hashem himself changed the truth when he came to Abraham. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Hashem doesn't like to lie. Nobody is allowed to lie. Midvar sheker tirchak. It's lo tishakru velo tekachashu ish ba'amito. It's written in the Torah. But when Sarah say, how am I going to be pregnant? My husband is an old man. <laughs> She's 90. <laughs> He's 100. 
The problem is not by the man. Here you just saw Rabbi, 88 years old, just had a boy. Meaning, men that are very old can still bring kids to the world. The problem is by the ladies. Once they pass 50, 55, usually that's it. So the problem is, problem is by her, but who is she blaming? Avraham. What did she say? She said, Adoni Zaken, my, my, my master, meaning my husband, is old. How am I going to be pregnant? And Hashem came to Avraham and changed the whole story. What did he say? Why Sarah say that she's old? There's anything if I want that cannot happen? Why Hashem changed the story? To prevent a fight between a husband and wife. So you're not allowed to instigate, to break the peace in a family. That's only one case. What happened if we would create 500 bad cases of marriage? If you say the story online, 500 houses will have to get divorced. Obviously, you're not allowed. Do you understand the calculation? So that's the story of Esther. She said, well, if Hashem will punish me for what I'm doing, I'm willing to take that suffering. I have to save the Jewish nation from a holocaust, whatever the price would be. And that's when I told you the story of Shlomo Karlibach, Rabbi Shlomo Karlibach, that when the Hasid called him and asked him, who gave you permission to, to make women dance with your guitar in front of your eyes, in front of the men, and you continue to play music, and you hold their hands, they reach their hands to you, and you shake their hands? So you know what was his answer? I got shocked, to be honest with you. I mean, it's been so many years, but I never forget that story. You know what he answered him? He said to him, I know that I will have to be burned in hell for this. But to save a soul of a Jew, it's worth it for me. <laughs> By now, the Hasid was mute already. Hasid was ag aggressive. He has very good points. He attacked him correctly. But once a person says to you, you're, you're right, I'm wicked, I'm wicked. I, I did something terrible. You're right, you're 100% right, right. I'm not denying it. <laughs> I'm not denying I did it in front of the public. But knowing that what I did made 10, 20, 50, 100, 500 men and women interested in keeping Torah mitzvot, coming to Shabbat dinners, starting to show interest in davening, singing my songs with his, all from the prayers and Tehillim, if I will go to hell for that, I'm willing to live with that. So, it's a very fragile subject. And I'm sure that people that will hear this recording will have a lot to say. So we'll, just to make one thing clear, I'm not a postek alachot. I'm not telling you what's allowed, what's not allowed. We're talking here divrei Torah. Some agree, some disagree. I told you the words of the Ramah. The Ramah is a very established Chacham. It's not just another rabbi, right? It's the chief rabbi of the Ashkenazim in the last 500 years. He said, a woman doesn't have to get killed if she's going to be forced to have intimacy with someone she doesn't want. Especially if it's going to bring a huge toilet larabim, meaning great salvation to the public. In Shulchan Aruch, Shulchan Aruch, the Jewish book of law, it's written, כאשר אדם רואה שבעקבות עבירה אחת שהוא יעשה תבוא ישועה לרבים, מותר לו לעשות זאת. Shulchan Aruch. If a person who see that what is the sin is about to commit will save the public, is allowed to do it. How is he allowed to do it? First, he has to ask his rabbi, the chacham, rabbi, this is the case, I have to do it now. For instance, I have to lie. I have to go to court, and they're going to ask me a question, and they make me swear under oath. They have to say the truth and nothing but the truth. If I will say the truth, 50 religious Jews will go to jail. 
Yes, they did something wrong. There's nothing to be proud of what they did. The question is, do they deserve to sit 10 years in a prison with all the monsters over there? Absolutely not. That's not the laws of God and not the laws of the Torah. So what's the right thing to do? Yes, I saw that they did it, and now they're going to destroy their family, all the kids in Yeshivot. The mother has no tuition, the kids are off the derech. 150 people lost their religion and life of something that according to the Torah there's no punishment, such as inside trading. Someone told him, buy this stock. Next week it will become 10 times higher. How do you know? My father is an analyst, he told me. My friend, take all the money you have and buy this stock. Why? It's now 20, next week it will be 200. You serious? Yeah, how much money you have? I have a million dollars. Run, buy stocks from this company. And wait a week. Look, a week later, you bought, with a million dollars you bought, uh, 50,000 shares, $20 each. You came in the morning, you turn on your computer, the one million became 10 million. Three days later, open please. What? FBI. They have computer software. They look at suspicious transaction. Nobody ever bought a million dollars on this lousy company. The entire week they don't sell million dollar stocks. All of a sudden one guy out of nowhere, the check is record, he never put a million dollar on a stock. Maximum he buys 10,000, 15,000. Pop! Transaction, million dollar, and right away before the news came out. They know right away. They start, they get a warrant, they check his emails, they check his text. When the FBI knock on your door, usually you're, you're a dead man. It's not like in Israel. When the Israeli Shabak knock on your door, they will already find what to blame you with. Don't worry. Even if you prove that you're not guilty on that, their ego will not let them release you, especially if you're religious. They'll find other things, don't worry. They'll find one to do. Here, when they, you know what's different when the police knock on your door and the FBI knock on your door? Someone wants to explain it to me. So when the police knock on the door, that means someone complained about you. The police had no idea if you're guilty or not. They have to arrest you and start an investigation. Once you're arrested, they get a warrant, they go, they check your computer, they check your house, they check your emails, and then they decide if to press charges or not. At the moment they arrest you, it's only a suspicion. When the FBI knock on your door, it's a done case already. They already accumulate years of information, recorded conversation, they took pictures of you meeting people. They don't knock based on a suspicion. When they knock, you're a dead man. There's no way for you to come out. They don't rush to arrest you. They wait until they know one million percent that that's it. You're done. And then they offer you a, a plea. Give us 20 other names. And instead of going to prison for 20 years, you will serve only two years. You have to be a big tzaddik, not to turn other people in. That's against the Torah, it's Moser. Shalom amod ban isayon hazeh, that's all I can tell you. You never have this kind of test in your life. Some people were religious, acceptable in a community. When the FBI got them, they flip on others. Not only that, one of them was trying to frame an important rabbi from Israel, a very important one, while he was wired, trying to record him that he should get arrested before he goes to Israel. But that rabbi was clever. He smelled that something is fishy from the conversation. Why? He wanted to get a few years less in prison. So he's willing to send a holy man to prison for no, no guilt, just that he will give them someone else also to put in jail. This is very ugly, this world. So Rabotai, Esther now is making a party. And who comes? The main Nazi, Aman. How many kids Aman has? 208. 208, more than Bin Laden. Double. 
But Lavin Laden have 20 wives. Every one of them contributed 10, 11. Also Amman, we have many wives. It was in style to have many wives in those days. So why only 10 of them were hung on a tree? Because they were activists against the Jews. The other one were passive. They were Nazis, but they didn't do anything actively to get the Jews into trouble. The ten sons were making problems everywhere. Speeches, political activity. Kill the Jews, kill the Jews, it's the Jews' fault. The Jews destroy the economy. The Jews, the Jews, everywhere they go. You know, like Al Sharpton and his friends. This kind, Bernie Sanders, Imach Shimo. That's why they were hung on a tree. The other ones didn't touch them. Later, later on, they got permission to take revenge against all the Nazis. But for the time being, they didn't touch them. Esther making a party. Remember, this is all planned here. Esther needs to make a party for the Goim to come get drunk. See that it's all divine plan here. Plan. She's, she's giving a speech to the audience. That's another scene. A woman not supposed to give uh, speeches to the men. Religious woman. But she gives a speech to all the goyim there. Yesh ish tsar oyev. There is an evil man here. An enemy. That wants to kill my nation. I mean, no one knows her nation yet. She's a mystery. Five years she's in a palace. Now one person told that she's Jewish. No one betrayed her. There was no lefty liberals then. Lo ayu smolanim. To. He wants to kill my nation. And then what? Well, just when he give, she gives the speech and Achashverosh is in shock. What happened next? They ask her, who? This Haman, Ish, Tsar, Oyev, this enemy. What? He wants to kill my wife and her nation? Hashverosh went crazy. Remember, he's his best friend. Everything turned in a second. And just when Esther pointed Haman, Hashem gave him a smack. And what happened? He fell on Esther's bed. Her bed. The bed of the queen. Haman is like this in her bed. And Hashem drove him crazy, the Achashverosh. Ma? You enter my wife's bed? Forget it. You know, Im imagine, try the Arab Sheikh in Saudi Arabia. Go lay in his wife's bed for one minute, see what will happen to you. No one will even know about it. Before they'll find out, you'll be already hanged somewhere. Why they hang him? Don't ask questions. <laughs> he heard the king's ego. Remember, Achashverosh is in control of 127 countries, from Odu Ad Kush, from India to Africa. How many miles is from India and Africa, Benji? I sent it to you already. 10,000? How many? 10,000 miles? 9,000 kilometers. 9,000 kilometers. 6,000 miles of countries and islands. He control. In a day, there were no airplanes, no car, no trains, only horses and donkeys. Do you know what it means to occupy 127 countries? Everybody pays you taxes? Huh? Think about it. Think about the ego. And he falls on your wife's bed. Achashverosh <laughs> saw that. And just when it happens, who shows up? <laughs> Charbona. One of the workers in the palace. Charbona. A guy. He shows up, he said, by the way, your majesty, not only he wants to kill all the Jews, not only he's laying in your wife's bed, he also built a tree. 50 amot, 25 meters, 75 feet, 75 feet, from bottom to the ceiling, how many feet we have? What is it, 10? 10 feet? So that means almost seven floors, right? If every floor is 10 feet, that's seven floors, huge tree. 
Why you need such a big tree? 10, 15 feet is not enough to hang someone? You hang him, you push the chair and he's hung. No, he wants the whole city to see them. He puts it in a high place and the tree is so high, like the Muslim make that pole in the mosque, that for no matter where you are in town, you're going to see the mosque. Where the Muslim learned it? From the Jews. It's written in Shulchan Aruch that the synagogue have to be the highest in town. Do we follow these laws today? No? No. Here, this synagogue. They are right here in Coney Island Avenue, bigger buildings. Why? In the old days, it was realistic to do it like this. But the way construction has changed with the years, it's impossible. Also, Anus. There's no way to make sure that the synagogue is the highest. Why? Well, because they build now buildings that are 50 flights. What are you going to do? You make, you make the shul in, on the moon? Where are you going to stick the shul? How people are going to go now? Every time they want to go pray, they have to climb 50 floors up? Shabbos elevator. Shabbos elevator. So, when I was in Istanbul, you know, Istanbul is divided to two continents. Asia and Europe. I gave two lectures in two continents in the same day. <laughs> in one day I gave a lecture in Asia and a few hours later in Europe. <laughs> Across the bridge. Istanbul. When I came to the shul, that, that shul was back in the news that the terrorists over there attacked that shul. They threw bombs in the yard of the shul and killed a few people there. There is a sign there for the terror attack. And the Jews over there in Istanbul, they closed the backyard with a ceiling made from thick glass, very thick glass, maybe 10 inches thick, anti-bomb, you know, like in the banks that if you shoot, it cannot penetrate the glass. They made a very expensive glass in the entire yard of the synagogue is covered with this glass. But guess what? There are few very, very tall trees. They made a circle in the ceiling, special circle, and the tree goes out of the ceiling. Another 20, 30 meter high. Very, very high trees. I asked the Turkish guy, <laughs> the Jew, I told him I don't understand the logic here. Why did you go through all this headache to make holes in the ceiling to let these lousy trees go all the way up? Well, wouldn't it be just easier to get rid of these trees? He no. told me, you're crazy. You're going to get the death penalty here if you cut one of these trees. I said, what? Said, these trees are hundreds of years old. If you cut one of them, you know the Turks will kill you. That's their pride, these trees. We had no, no choice. We had to build around it. That's when I realized the tree that Haman made for Mordechai. Right there in front of my eyes, 75 feet. Trees like this. He put a tree like this, and now they wa he wants to hang Mordechai there. That the whole, and Harbona shows up in perfect timing to the room. By the way, your majesty, not only wants to kill all the Jews, not only is occupying your wife's bed, he already made a tree to hang the chief rabbi of the Jews. The one that saved your life back then. Remember two people wanted to poison you? He is the one who came to warn you. He wants to hang the chief rabbi? Take him quickly and hang him. <laughs> In one second, everything turned 180 degrees. But I skipped a little bit. Let's go back. <sighs> now we have a question. Can King Ahasuerus judge Haman? according to the laws of Persia, or no? He's a dictator. The problem is that they had a law in Persia, which is a decent law, 
that if the matter in a court relates to you personally, you cannot be the judge in that case. You have to disqualify yourself. So the king wants to kill Haman for falling on his wife's bed, which is a very big crime and embarrassment to the king. So technically, if you take him to a different judge, it will be death penalty. But how can a Hashverosh judge someone that came to his wife's bed? It's not objective. The law was changed when the was killed. The law was changed. By whom? By Amman. Amman was the one who pushed a new order. When? When Achashverosh wanted to kill Vashti, Haman was the one who told him, you must do it. The rabbis didn't want to get involved. They knew. Oi lim omar, oi lim lo omar. Achashverosh said, but how can I kill her? She's my wife. I cannot judge her. I have to send her to the court. He said, now it's the time to change the law. You have the power to change the laws? Yes. You're not allowed right now to judge her. Let's all vote. Change the law, and a minute later you judge her. Same Haman, who actually convinced him to get rid of Vashti by making the king able to judge even cases that relates to him. The king is above the law. Why did he do it? Because he wanted his daughter to be the wife of Achashverosh. And how are you going to get rid of Vashti? She's a grand-granddaughter of Nebuchadnezzar. She comes from a very important family and she's the prettiest woman in the world. Haman's wife is no competition to Vashti. He saw an opportunity like all the dirty politicians. The truth has nothing to do with them. It's only opportunities. Ah, that's very good for me. The whole country will suffer. Who cares about the country? It's all for me. Right away, what did they do? You must get rid of Vashti. Women will disrespect their husband. You're right, you're right. Okay, I'm sentencing her to death. Look at my daughter. She's also very rich, pretty. She's going to be very good wife. There was the whole plan. That law that he did because he wanted to become one day the ruler of the 127 countries, because once his daughter will be the, the queen, the son that will be born will be the king. With his connection and his money, he will run him to be the king. Hashverosh has other kids. Count on Haman that he will already have the lobby in Washington to help his son to get elected right away. So you see what's going on here? What you cook, one day you'll be forced to eat. That's what life is all about. <laughs> Everything you prepare and pre United States, they, they train Al-Qaeda against Russia. They took Bin Laden, gave him money, sent CIA to train him to make a, a little army to have guerrilla war against the Russians, to make the Russians to attack them in Afghanistan, attack them. And what happened? Whatever they prepared for Russia, turned around into their own heart. I give you hundreds of cases like this. United States were angry at the Iranian Shah because of the oil prices. He did not surrender to their pressure. They told him, don't mess with us. We're going to bring Khomeini from, from France. We're going to make a revolution here. You know our power. The Shah didn't surrender. They brought Khomeini from Iran. Forty something years, destroyed the whole world. Why? Because the Shah did not bow down to them. It's unbelievable what's happening in this world. You're going to do one thing and you destroy it a hundred times worse later on. Why? They don't have Torah. The Torah says, a real clever person always see 20 steps ahead. This will lead to this, and this would lead to this. That's why you need to consult with rabbis. Why? You may be a very smart person yourself. You may even have life experience. But the rabbi has a few things that you may not have. First, he has experience. He deals with the public all the time. 
He hears from people. He develops connection to the right people that can help. Plus, he has the siyata dishmaya, holiness, Torah, constantly helping people. He has special siyata dishmaya from Hashem. When you come to him, he will give you an advice that can save your life and your children's life. The problem is, is the ego that people have. Ah, no, I don't ask. Just today I had a case like this. The holy rabbi next to my house. There's a woman there that is about to lose her house in Israel. And very, very cruel over there. They take away your house, they leave nothing. With lawyers and penalties, they'll eat basically all the money you own in a the house, they'll leave you with nothing. Zero mercy. Big reshaim over there, all the lawyers and all the judges and the terrible what they do to miserable people. They own 99% of the house, they have a little debt to Israeli bank. By the way, the judge, the judge is in a pocket, the judge sign, they knock on your door, they break everything, they take everything. Two months later, you lost everything you have. They put it in the auction, they sell it. 100,000 to this lawyer, 20,000 to this, or Tzahala Poal take their share, the lawyers, the penalty, the interest. In the end, you're left with nothing. She's about to lose the house. I told her, listen, I, buy, I found you a buyer. I have someone who's willing to come buy the house quickly and pay them their debt. Do not let the house go to their hands. Once they grab it, Hashem Yerachem, you lose everything. That's all they have. Poor couple. But the woman did not surrender. She had such a muna. I say to myself, I wonder if it's a muna or stupidity. Sometimes there's almost no difference between a muna and stupidity. But she was devout. She does. She's not giving up. I'm counting on Hashem. It's not going to make us lose the only things we have. Unbelievable. So she went to that holy rabbi. There's a rabbi in my neighborhood. He's one of the best Ashkenazi rabbis in America. People walk an hour in the heat with their streimel to listen to him on Shabbos. Hundreds of people. Big holy tzaddik. Right away, connected her with the rabbi in Israel. Such a big shot. I spoke to him today on the phone. That rabbi has all the Israeli banks in his pocket. Do you believe that? They're already grabbing a house. They're taking away the house. They're already in the process. Any day she's going to get a notice that they changed the lock. That rabbi called the bank, stopped everything in one phone call, cut half of the debt, and told me, Mizrahi, you make sure that half of the money is transferred to this bank account and leave me the rest. I do it for more than 20 years. If she would not go to that rabbi, there's no chance whatsoever she would lose a house that worth four, five hundred thousand dollars. Nothing would be left for twenty thousand dollars debt. She would lose it. So this is just one out of thousands of examples that sometimes you come to ask a question, Rabbi Yerbanet, and the Rabbi already has a connection that may help the case. It happens all the time. You know, there was one Rosh Hashiva in Bnei Brak. He came to Rav Chaim Kanievsky, he told him, Rabbi, I need a bracha, I must get $50,000 urgent. I have two weeks. If not, I go bankrupt. My yeshiva is bankrupt. I'm going for the first time to America. I don't even know how to speak English. I don't know addresses. I don't know which be. I don't know anything. I'm going there with emunah to that Hashem will direct me to collect $50,000. Rav Chaim Kanievsky gave him a bracha and he went to America. The poor guy, three weeks is here did not even collect to cover his airfare. Doesn't speak English, doesn't know people. First time here. Go here, God come to the shul, collect dollar, people give him dollar, two dollar, five dollar. Doesn't know what to do anymore. So okay, I guess Hashem doesn't want the yeshiva to survive. What can I do? I tried my best. Three weeks I left my wife, children, the yeshiva. He walks, he goes back to Israel, he has 10 days left to shut the door. And he doesn't have the heart to tell all the Avrechim that on 10 days they're not going to get their monthly salary. He has to shut the door. He's breaking his head. Then someone came, Rabbi, you have an envelope. Where? From Rav Chaim Kanievsky. 
He said to come give it to you. He opened the envelope, a check for $50,000. <coughs> what is it? He ran quickly to Rav Chaim Kanievsky. Rabbi, I was by you three weeks ago. You told me to go to America. And what is this check? He said to him, one Jew made a big real estate deal in Australia. He came today to me and he told me, Rabbi, this is my master from the deal. <laughs> Meaning half a million dollars, uh, $50,000, it's because he made half a million dollar commission on that deal. He told me, Rabbi, you do whatever you think is right with that. And I remember that you came to me about your yeshiva. So I want to give you this money. I know you, know you need it. He said to him, unbelievable, you just saved my yeshiva. But can I ask you a question? You told me good luck to go to America. And the salvation came two blocks away from my home. I went to America like a dog. I slept in mattresses, in places, in motels, in people's homes. I got so, so much embarrassment, waited for people outside the door in the freezing weather. In the end, I barely collected for the car and for the airfare. I didn't bring a dollar here back. And then in the end, Hashem sent me the salvation from across the street. Good question, no? What do you think the answer to this would be? Rav Chaim Kanievsky told him a lesson in life. He told him, you're not getting the point right. The only reason that this guy came to me to give me this 50,000, knowing that I know about your problem, and the last thing I want is yeshiva to close down, knowing I'm going to give, it's Mishamayim, that I'm going to call you and give you this check. The only reason that it happened is because you went to America and suffered for three weeks. And you show Hashem how much you're willing to suffer without your wife and your children and your learning and getting humiliated and getting embarrassed and you're such a holy big chacham. People treat you like garbage, like some kind of a driver, like a mailman, wait outside. Uh, my husband is going to come in two hours, go, come back, treat you like a dog, like they do to the collectors here. After Hashem saw what you're willing to go through to continue to support Torah, he sent you the salvation. It's not me, not this guy, nothing. You had to get it. And Hashem wanted to show you that if you think that the salvation will come from America, it doesn't have to. It will come from where he wants, not from where you want. You do Ishtadlut here, and your salvation comes from there. Do hmm. you know how many times a girl dated a guy? She didn't like him. After 10 minutes in a date, she knew it's not for him. So she said to the Shotchan, I'm not interested. But I have a friend that may be good for him. This whole date was for that Shiduch. But how would you get it? Nobody knows about you and her. So you have to get a middleman. So Hashem made you a false date with this girl, which is Bechlal not Shayach. The girl said, why are they giving me this guy? It's not for me, it's not what I want. But it's perfect for my friend. You understand what's happening here? That's why I always tell people, no matter what decent shiduch they offer you, even you, you didn't want Faradi, you didn't want Ashkenazi, you wanted this, you wanted that kind of Hasid, and not go and try, you don't know Hashem's plans. What did you lose? An hour of your time? One time, two, ten, twenty, fifty times you went. In the end, in the fifty-first time, it's going to happen. It's worth it. Plus the suffering, the frustration of another bad date, and another one, and another one, makes the final original date closer. The more you suffer, the more mercy they have on you in Shammai. Especially when you don't complain. So, Rabotai, Haman... A man saw that his end is coming. Vayar Aman ki kalta elav araa. What does it mean? Ki kalta elav araa means his end arrived. Ki finish with yud. Kalta finish with hey. Ela finish with vav. Araa finish with hey. Yud. And they 
and Vav and Hey, the name of God. The end of the wicked people will come only when God would want it and only when he will say so. Nothing else. That's the moment that Hashem decided, now let's teach this Nazi a lesson he will never forget. The tree you prepared for him will be for you and your children. The house, your house, will come to the rabbi. Everything you prepared against the Jews will be now all used against you. The law that you changed nine years, you worked very much to change it, the laws nine years ago, will be used now against you when I'm judging you to death. The horse that you wanted, Mordechai, to take you on the horse of the king, make you wear the crown, you will, everything, Mida, Keneged Mida. You have to, to be blind not to see the end of Hashem. So, Rabotai, there were two men, Viktan and Teresh. They were the chefs of Achashverosh. They wanted to poison him. What did Hashem do? Made Mordechai be nearby. And he listens to those two chefs, how they plan to put poison in the food tonight. What language they were, st were, were speaking? Torsi. Torsi. Because remember, Hashvosh has many, many nationalities. So I guess they didn't like him. So they speak la language Torsi. Mordechai understands their language. He listens. How Mordechai knew their language? Every rabbi in a Sanhedrin must know 70 languages. Do you know any other person in the world that speaks 70 languages? Today, I think eight is the most. Biden? Biden can speak English. What do you mean? <laughs> Biden. <laughs> in his imagination, he speaks 800 languages. You know, I wanted to translate my film Torah and science to Chinese. One guy came to me and said, I would like to sponsor it. Find a Chinese translator. Back then, it was, I don't know, 15 years ago, it was $4,000. It's four hours film to translate, to type, and to put the translation in the film. <laughs> the translator started. Then he said to me, listen, you know how many dialects you have in Chinese? <laughs> This is only Mandarin, I don't know, they have different languages. This only 5% of Chinese will understand. If I translate it like this, 6% will understand. If I translate it like this, 1% will understand. If I translate it like this, 10% understands. I say, you know what, how about you forget about the job? <laughs> it's, it's worthless. Why? There's so many dialects and so many languages. How do I know who's going to listen? Man, oh, I need this. Why we wanted to do it? The guy said, listen, Rabbi, you always do Kiru for Jews, Kiru for Jews, and for some righteous going. You have two billion idol worshippers in China. Let them watch your film with Chinese translation. 20, 30 million of them would stop being idol worshippers. Worth it for me, $4,000, a huge achievement. It's right. <laughs> 20 million goyim are na, no longer idol worshippers in the world. It's a big thing. This guy had money. He wanted to do it. <laughs> Later, I found out what was really behind it. I told you, there's always a personal agenda. What's the personal agenda? Son married a Chinese girl. And she doesn't want to convert. Not that it will help if she converts, because his son is more a goy than her. How is it going to help that the Chinese will become a rabbit sand when their husband has a earring over here? You know? So, Mordechai knew 70 languages, so he understands what they talk about. He comes to Esther, he tells her the story. They made an investigation. Quickly, they took the food, they brought a dog. <laughs> Poor dog, the dog ate it and died, and they hung both of them. After these things, meaning what just happened, the king got saved, his life got saved, he started to raise Haman, make him closer to him, 
Among was in the beginning a Bukharian bar, eh, not Bukharian, a barber. He was a barber, and then he became slowly, slowly the richest man. He's wealthier than Achashverosh. How you may, made so much money by cutting hair? I don't know how to answer this question. I don't know. But he became very wealthy. Rashi says, after Hashem created the remedy for the Jewish nation, now comes the problem. There's no problem coming before the solution is first created. Remember this rule. Balayla hu, at that night, nadedash nata melech. He cannot fall asleep. Vayikra besefer hazichronot. He has a diary. Let's see what happened in the last few months in my life. And then he saw that case. So wait a minute, this Jew saved my life. Did, did I ever pay him back? Did I pay him back? Quickly, where is that rabbi? He saved my life. Did we do something for him? Nothing. Who made him now all of a sudden not fall asleep? Hashem. Who gave him an idea to read his diary, his life story? Hashem. Who made him focus on a page that he almost died and Mordechai saved him and now he's thinking it's not fair. I never paid that Jew back. Don't you see the end of Hashem? <laughs> so Rabotai, the Gemara says, If you ever lose an item, your car key, your wallet, your passport, it's critical, you know, sometimes you lose something important, a document can be more than money, so much headache to restore it. There is a good suggestion. Amar Rabbi Binyamin, כל העולם בחזקת סומין עד שהקדוש ברוך הוא מאיר את עיניהם. Every human being in the world is blind. Until Hashem decides to open his eyes. Meaning when you see now the road, the street, you drive, you see people, you're not blind, right? You see. Ah, we're not talking about seeing the road, seeing the world, seeing people on the street. That's not what we're talking about. Blind meaning for the most important thing in life. You don't see the supervision of Hashem, you don't see the miracles, you don't see the plan, you don't see the hand, you don't see anything. Every little thing crush you, de depresses you, make you give up. You don't see. Because you don't see, you don't know what to be careful of. You don't know what to appreciate. You don't know who you owe gratitude and who you have to stay away from. And you turn into a worthless, miserable, ungrateful person. Not because you're evil. Because you do not open your eyes to see who you owe your life to. I once said that many years ago. People that I saved them from eternal destructions went to speak against me more than anyone else. There's one guy in Great Neck, Persian guy. From what I saved this guy and his family and his cousin, 20 people, they were like, much like Goim. I made them all ballet tshuva, I helped them. They were coming to my house every two, three weeks for Shabbat. I helped the guy, I helped him with his shiduch, I helped him with his business, he made tons of money. In the end, he heard somebody told him a lie about me. That never happened. And he started to run to people and tell them things, around, and he added so much to the story. One time I saw his father in a wedding, and I said to him, I don't mind. I mean, I'm used to people cursing me on the internet for saying the truth, so it doesn't really bother me. But when you are a witness how much I've done for your son, you threw him out of the house, I force you to take him back. Without me, he would be dead already. He would be some junkie, drug addict on the street. Everything he has now is thanks to me, everything. He's breathing thanks to me. Forget it. The mitzvot he keeps. What in the world was on his mind to run and make up stories? The father almost dropped dead. He went like, he, didn't, he couldn't talk. There are people like this. The Gaon Mivina, once one person told him, hey, someone is speaking against Kvodarav in town. 
The Gaon Mivina says it's very surprising. I don't remember I ever did any favor to this person. Meaning, the more he owes you, the more he's ungrateful to you. Who does it? I told you once, the Satan never compromise on a small achievement. He wants the most. So if he detects someone that is an ungrateful character, doesn't appreciate his parents, doesn't appreciate rabbis, doesn't appreciate Hashem, doesn't appreciate, that's his nature, selfish. When he wants to bury him with the sin of ungratefulness, he won't bury him on someone that he barely owe anything. He will give him a test that someone that he hold the most in the life, how he's gonna go to murder that person in order for the Satan to make a case against him in a court of heaven that he would also lose everything. Because the Gemara say, once you are ungrateful to people, for sure you also are ungrateful to Hashem. For sure, if you don't appreciate your parents, you don't appreciate your teachers, you don't appreciate people who support you, who helps you. One time a person told me, you know, he was talking Lashon HaRa by the rabbi. He told me, this rabbi, if you give him donation, he answer your calls. If you don't give him donation, he doesn't have time for you. you I'm sure you heard this claim before, no? What would you answer? It's a good case or no? He has a good claim or no? I told him, let me ask you a question. This rabbi, how many people he knows? Tens of thousands of people. Is it normal for one individual to answer thousands of people's questions and problems in life, meet with them, answer them when they have funerals, when they have your side, when they have bar mitzvah, when they have marriage issues, when they have bankruptcy issues, mental issues, uh, authorities, police, IRS, non-stop problems to people. He has X amount of time between his learning, between his own family, between uh, the preparing lectures. He has, let's say, two or three hours a day that can help the public. So let's say a thousand people need his help, and only 50 of them donate and help his yeshiva, help his activities, help what he does. According to the Torah, who gets priority? The people that help his yeshiva, that he owe them a huge gratitude, so when they have a problem, he must help them. Stranger, he, he can help, he can ignore. It's, he's, he's not a servant of the whole world. But someone that he owes a gratitude to, right? Someone help you. Now he has a problem a year later. You have no right to say no. You can never be ungrateful to him. So if you have X amount of time, and it's not even enough to help the people that sponsor your cause. It's not enough. Would you take the people that thanks to them you do everything you do, thanks to their support, you put them on the side and you help strangers? You are a monster if you do such thing. You're not a rabbi, you're a faker. First rule in Judaism is gratefulness. If you're nasty to your wife, but you ha you're nice to every other woman who has problems in life, she calls, she cries, hey, I need my husband, my son, can you do this, can you meet him, can you talk to him, can you call him, can you help, can He's nice to the whole world. And uh, his wife, he treats her like a shoe. Like a shoe on the floor. All his gratefulness, to pe all his um, chesed to people counts like nothing. Why? Because the one you owe the biggest gratitude starts from the people in you. That help you do your laundry, help you go to the bank for you, make you food, raise your children, take care of your problem, take your arrogant behavior, being abused by you. Someone is taking a big toll here. So you have, a, you have an obligation. I told you once, my rabbi, he told me, how many nights you give lecture? It's to give every night. He told me, you're out of your mind. Who gave you such a dark Torah? He told me, I used to give like this also. And Chacham Ben Zion, Abba Shaul, I came to him, I said, Rabbi, Baruch Hashem, I have a big siyata dishmaya. Every night I do chuk bayit, and I make few shomre shabbat. Every night. Five, three, seven, every night. Chilonim. This was 30 years ago, this story. Chacham Ben Zion told me, why are you so happy about it? Is your wife agree to all of that? 
say she's not so happy about it. But she see the results. He said, all of what you do, it's a sin. There's no mitzvah here. I've been seeing on Abba Shaul, the biggest chacham in the world. The biggest. I told him it's no mitzvah over here. Why? Because you sign in a ketubah that you give your wife place to live, food to eat, clothes to wear, intimacy, relationship, support, companionship, you know, marriage. Marriage is a partnership. You sign with two witnesses and you swore on it under the Shekhinah, the Chupa. So you ignore this, the agreement you made and you do the exact opposite of what you committed. It's not a mitzvah. Mitzvah aba be'avera ena mitzvah. Look how Chacham look at things. We would think, wow, who cares the wife? Let her sacrifice. We're saving five, ten souls every day. She's not happy. Like they say in Israel, Zabasha. It's her problem. Maybe she doesn't even deserve to be the wife of this Chacham. If she doesn't see the importance of saving souls. No one questioned the importance of saving soul. It's the greatest thing in the world. Hashem say. It's written in Zohar, in Rabbeinu Bechaye. Nothing comes near it. But once it's done with stolen money, it's not a mitzvah. You go and steal and go and do mitzvot with the money. It's not a mitzvah. It's mitzvah aba aba Once you do it by breaking the contract you sign. It's not a mitzvah, it's mitzvah ba be'avira. He told him, the maximum I allow you, it's two nights a week. And that's only if your wife agree, belev shalem. So he told me, whatever Chacham ben Zion told me, I tell you. It's not my idea. Chacham ben Zion, Abba Shaul. It's a legend, holy legend. No one had a brain like this in the whole world. His, his brain was beyond understanding. I told you once, my rabbi told me. He told me, Rabbi Chacham Ben Zion had thousands of students. All of them big Talmidei Chachamim. All of them. They are big Chachamim today in the world. And he told me, the only one that understood him fully, fully, was Chacham Sason Shabbat. Alav Shalom. He so said, everybody else understood maximum 20% from his brilliance. Maximum. Include myself. And you should see what a sharp chacham he is. He so include myself, 20%. For hours after his shiur, we were breaking the head to understand why he said this, why he said The only one who understood everything was this Sasson Shabbat from Ramot, Yerushalayim. He said, Chacham Ben Zion came to the shiur only for Sasson Shabbat. He was giving him pleasure. Because everyone compared was like a little moron. And we were talking about the biggest rabbis in the world today. Don't get me wrong. Genius people. If you're not genius, you cannot even dream about being in his shiur. There's nothing to even come. But he said, Chacham Ben Zion, he said, can hear in a recording. He says, where is Sasson? Sasson Po? Yeah, he's here. We can start. Or when he finished explaining the whole Malach, Sasson, you okay? Ataiti? Shar Lamshikh? Can I continue? If Sasson would not with his head, he move on. Others that didn't understand, they don't dare to ask. Later, they will go on the notes that everyone write, try to understand the shiur. This is who told him that. Hashem decides how many of his children will be saved. Right now, he chose you to do this holy work. You and all your supporters. He doesn't need really you. Hashem can do it in many different ways. If Hashem wants, some Nazi will make Jews Baalei Tshuva, like Haman. Haman made more Baalei Tshuva than any rabbi in history. Haman made more Baalei Tshuva than all 48 uh, prophets and seven female prophets. The Gemara say it. Achashverosh taking his ring and giving it to Haman, sign whatever you want against the Jews, 
made every Jew fast for three days, cry, read all Tehillim. They didn't do Lela Seder. Everyone gathered in the city of Shushan, in the center of Persia. I don't know how many Jews were there, million, two, three, who knows? Huge number. Reading Tehillim for three days, fasting, wearing sack, putting ashes on their, on their face, on their head. No Pesach, Pikuach Nefesh. There was no holiday. Why? We're all going to die. We are, we are about to die. Haman made a decree on Adar. When the Jews saw the notes that arrived, that Pesach that came a month after Purim, by now all the Jews understood that they're all going to die, and the Goim will take all their property, and that's it, that's their end. They cancel the holiday! Baruch Hashem Haman didn't make the decree today. I should uh, rephrase my question. Baruch Hashem, there was no social media in the time of Haman. <laughs> if there was social media, in one week all Jews would be dead already. Why did it take a year until the date? Because you need time to spread the rumor. You have to send to 127 countries, messengers, they have to go with boats, they have to take camels and donkeys, you know what the mission it is? There's no telephones. Hey, Bibi, it's Joe. Which Joe? Sleepy Joe. Oh, yes, how can I help you, Mr. President? Do me a favor. Stop this and this and that. Two minutes later, it's on the news. Two minutes later. But Haman, it needed time. That was, an, that was crucial for the Jews to do tshuva and to get saved. I want to just finish, Ramash, five minutes. The rest I will finish tomorrow. How do we know that Hashem opened up, the, opened the eyes of people and they're all considered blind until Hashem decides to open up their eyes? As a verse in the Torah, Vaifkach Hashem et enei Agar. Hashem opened the eyes of Agar, the mother of Ishmael. And all of a sudden they saw water in the desert. Meaning, until Hashem did not open her eyes, it's right there and she cannot see it. And naim laim velo yiru. O vaifkach Hashem et enei Bilam. There's an angel with a sword attacking Bilam's donkey. Bilam doesn't see it. The donkey is pushing to the door. What's going on? He's beating up the donkey. It's his wife, the donkey. It's his wife. He lives with her. All of a sudden, Hashem opened up his eyes, he saw the angel, he got so scared. Oh, I'm sorry, what? I didn't know you here. How come you didn't see me until now? Because Hashem didn't want you to see me. First, you want to see how you behave to the donkey that you abused for so many years, that serves you, that suffers under your control every day. Ah, you're beating up the donkey, you ungrateful monster. Now let me show you why the donkey moves. You should have figured it out yourself. All of a sudden the donkey is behaving strange. That means that Hashem is here. Something is happening. Well, you cannot see. This is the prophet of the Goim, Bilam. The question that we have is, why Mordechai was quiet five years and didn't ask for any reward from the king? Why? Or at least, to tell Esther, the nation of Israel is in a very big jeopardy. Just please tell Hashverosh, my uncle Mordechai is the one who saved your life. Can you give him an appointment? And in the meeting, I will make sure to remind him that I am the one that saved his life. No? That's Ishtadlut. You want to save the nation from a holocaust. Five years he doesn't talk about it. The king is alive thanks to me. My nation are about to go into gas chambers and I don't say anything about it. How can it be? The answer is Chazal say Mordechai had 100% confidence in Hashem. I do not do ishtadlut. What do I do? I trust Hashem, I pray, that's it. Whatever I deserve, I must get. 
That's why he did not bow down to Amman. Everyone bowed down to Amman except Mordechai. Millions on the street. Everyone who sees him has to bow down. Like in North Korea. In North Korea, they say uh, the, 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 the leader, whatever his name, uh, what's his name? Trump made him a name, Fat Man. So Fat Man is not feeling good. The Koreans stand on the street pretending that they cry. So that video, <laughs> they all cry. If you don't cry, they chop your head off. He has a birthday, everyone stand on the street. Hooray! Everybody see a man, they fall on their, fall on their, not just not with their head. They bow down, mamash, like an idol. And Mordechai look at him like this. And he go crazy. All the fame and the glory and my wealth and my control and I'm the right hand man of the king. Everyone bow down to me. It's worthless. This dirty Jew doesn't care about me. Look at him. He sees me and he make fun. He doesn't bow down. I must kill all Jews. That's how it all started, by the way. No, no, don't forget, this is Amalek. That's their job in life, Amalek. Aman Agagi. Agag is the king of Amalek. Saba Mikelem says, the world said that they are religious and they are believers, but it's all a bluff. You religious? Yes, until it comes to the money. You're religious until it comes to your reputation. You're religious until it comes to how many views you're gonna have if you say the truth. You're religious? Yes, only when they pay you to come to speak. But if they don't wanna pay, oh, all of a sudden there's no Kiruv. What happened to all your brilliant speeches about the importance of Kiruv? We're giving you an opportunity to save a hundred lost Jews. No, he wants $5,000 to come speak. And business class. Okay, we'll give you $5,000, but why business class? Another $3,000 to the garbage. What does it mean? What does it mean? You have to respect the Torah. Oh, the Torah means that your belly will have a little bit more space. Kvod Torah. What does it mean, Kvod Torah? He's going to sit in economy and people recognize him. And they all come. Rabbi, selfie. Wow, well, Rabbi, you don't fly business class when you're sitting here like a Echad Ha'am? That's the best part in your life, you fool. You make connection with all these chilonim. Rabbi, wow, my brother listens to you, made him religious, you made him. Can we take a picture? Can? What's your number here, USB? I once gave a whole seminar and a flight from Israel to here. <laughs> the whole section was mamash seminar, 10 hours speech, everyone, even the students standing like this, listening. Torah and science. Don't be mad. There was one, there was one, uh, there was one uh, Syrian religious girl, Esther, here from Flatbush. This is 20 years ago. She's probably in her 40s now. Maybe 50 even by now. She asked me, where are you from? I said, I'm giving lectures, this and that. Where are you from? I'm from Flatbush. She has few friends. Where we went to Israel on a trip. We're coming back. Starting to talk, I saw that they're not so religious. I'm giving them now shiur, another one, another one. All of a sudden, you have a hundred people and say, fantastic. You fly, the whole flight went like seminar for free. Where else will you see these people? Think about it. Let's just finish, Rabotai. The Saba Mikelem say, it's all a bluff. You're a believer? A smart person, if someone offended him, someone embarrassed you. And that someone is an important chacham. Talmit chacham. He did something wrong to you. You wish him to be punished or you pray that Hashem won't punish him? The truth, be honest. Chacham, you know, he knows the Rav Torah all his life he learned. He did some good things in his life. Maybe he wrote a few good books. Maybe even make Ba'alei Tshuva, which is even a special thing. He said something that offended you, let's say. Caused you embarrassment. Caused you to lose a few thousand dollars, maybe. Things happen, you know. Whenever you hear his name, ah, don't mention his name here. Is this, is that. One day you find out that that Chacham had Hashem Irachem, some 
accident, I don't know, problem, got arrested, who knows, you know, things happen. You happy or you sad? If you religious, you very sad. If you faker, you very happy. <laughs> if you want to know if you're really religious, that's the test. Why? Because a real religious man, it would break his heart that someone that did harm to him is being punished now by Hashem. Why? He got what he deserved. We all get our punishments. He, he never apologized. He never asked for mechila. Let him learn the hard way with all due respect to his chacham and Torah. No, you fool. There is a rule in life. Megalgelim schut al yede zakai, megalgelim chova al yede chayav. If that chacham is receiving now suffering or jail or accident or a disease or problem, I don't know, whatever, and that's as results of you, meaning you actually, the reason why he's being punished, that means you are wicked. If you were righteous, you will never be the broker between Hashem and the person that needs the punishment. Hashem will give him his punishment to some Arab terrorists, I don't know. It's nothing to do with you. So what's the right way? Whenever someone does something bad to you, you should start praying to Hashem, I'm begging you, don't punish him. Help him to do tshuva. For your own good. It's not an act of nobility, how do you call it? Nobility? No, 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 you're not, don't think that you're doing something great here. It's mandatory if you're smart. Even when someone owes you money, you have to forgive him right away. As, ba as bad as it is, as painful as it is, people love money, you know how it is. For your own good. You want to come back in reincarnation to receive it from this miserable guy? Okay, so in the next life you'll be a slave. So then what? You had to come here to the world to receive whatever you receive, instead of being in heaven with the Rambam and Moshe Rabbeinu. In the end, when you are the cause of someone being punished, even if you didn't mean it, he is the, he is the sinner, not you. 100%. No one can say that you caused him to do it. He, he chose to do it. But the first thing you do, Hashem, please forgive him. Why it's important? Because when a Satan come one day and he make a case against you, immediately your defense lawyer comes and say, excuse me. Okay, you're right. He did something wrong. Definitely, according to Torah, I deserve a punishment. But let's see what happened 10 years ago when someone did a lot worse thing to him, how he reacted. What did he do? He prayed for Hashem to help this person to do tshuva and God forbid he should not be punished. You want to punish someone like that? Immediately, case is closed. In the end, you only, only win from being mochel, from being ma'avir al midotav. Ma'avir al midotav, Chazal say, ma'avirim lo kol pesha'av. Someone who let go, is easy going. Machul, no problem. Someone call you, hey, Rabbi, I spoke against you many years, I now feel very guilty, I call to apologize. No problem, machul, no time to waste. You don't want to know what it was? No, no, no. I didn't tell you my name. I don't need to know your name. Machul, machul. Goodbye, finished. 100% machul. You sure? You sure? 100%? Nothing to worry about? I have a lot of problems recently. No, no, machul, machul. No, 100%. Well, why not? Not machul means he's going gonna, he's gonna to receive a punishment. So one day you will have the same test. You also, the same test, you also will fail. So whatever you wish him to get, or you were happy that he got, maybe you didn't wish him, but when he got it, you say, yes, din v'yesh dayan, deserve it. Same thing will happen to you. Rabbi Nachman Mibreslev said that most of the punishments we get in life is from saying that people did something and they deserve to get this. After we say on them that they deserve to get such and such, five years later, the Satan comes and builds a case against you, 
And he says, five years ago when someone did something similar, even less, he, in conversation with friends, said that he must be punished. That he has to be punished. He cannot go on like that. Now he did something worse. Based on his words, he must be punished. Your own words make the judgment on yourself. <laughs> Same thing when you moser din l'shamayim. Sarah say to Abraham, Hashem will judge between me and you. And she died right away. She lost many years of her life because of this sentence. When you say to someone, you know what? I leave it for Hashem. Hashem will judge between me and you. If you are the Baba Sali, you holy tzaddik, you never have any sin, okay, no big deal. But we, usually we're not the Baba Sali, let's put it that way. So if you say such a word, Hashem will judge between me and you, Hashem will, but it starts with you. By the time you will finish to pay for all your crimes and your sins, the last thing you care is about what Hashem will do to that criminal. Because they started with you. Life and death, it's all come out of your, from your mouth. Extra word can make you die. One word you didn't say can save life. Mamash, I saw it so many times in life. One extra word messed up the thing. One word extra you would say would change the whole thing. A lot of misunderstanding. And Rabotai... You have to be foolish not to see the Ashgachah of Hashem. I'm giving you a little preview for tomorrow's night because we finished here. Tomorrow we're going to speak about the human passion and uh, we're going to speak about how some of the rules were apply in the time of Achashverosh and Amman, the Nazis were using and parts from the book of Prophet Yecheskel, what's going to be the end of this Amalek, children of Amman. And the concept that Amman, children, the Gemara said that they learned Torah in Bnei Brak. And right away everybody asked, how can you, how they can learn Torah? They have to be Jewish. In order for them to be Jewish, you have to convert them. But the children of Amman are Amalek, it's mitzvah to kill them. In those days, if you see Amalek, you must kill him. That's what the Torah says. You cannot leave him another minute. Baruch Hashem, Hashem had mercy on us. We don't know today who's Amalek. Was there was a king, Sancheriv, he mixed all the nations. Everyone ran. They all got mixed. So when you see an Arab, you don't know for sure if he's Ishmael. When you see a German, you don't know for sure he's Amalek. Maybe he is, maybe he's not. When you see French, you don't know for sure. When you see Russian, you don't know for sure is Amalek or not. Maybe yes, maybe not. Even when you see a Jew, you don't know for sure is Jewish or not. Here, the, the former prime minister, the one who sued me, is a complete goy. 100% goy. The court took his side because they hate religion. It's 100% goy. Arik Sharon was also a goy. Many famous Israelis are goyim. Famous, very famous. Not only prime minister. Famous people on the media. Nobody knows they are going. I had one guy confess to me, his father was the king of the nightlife of Tel Aviv in the 80s and the 90s. He owned clubs and restaurants, very famous. It was all over the media. One time he came to me and he said to me, I'm not the son of this famous guy. Everyone thinks I am. But my mother cheated on him with an Italian guy in Italy and one of her shopping trip. And one time this guy broke a chair on my head. I asked him, what kind of a father hit his son with a chair, breaking it on his back and open up his head all bleeding? In one of his restaurants in Tel Aviv, he told me, Shtok, ya kelev, you're not my son. Tell your mother to find this Italian guy that made you. And this guy, <laughs> I made him bad tshuva. I moved to Los Angeles, I made him in a seminar. He told me, but nobody knows my secret. You're the only person in the world besides this famous guy and my mother, and now you are the third one who knows about it. Nobody knows about it. I never told the story to anyone. No one knows who I'm talking about. But here is an example. Everyone thinks he's going to inherit all the kingdom. It's Bechlal. In his case, he's still a Jew. But what would be if it would be the other way around? 
So this is the situation now. Today we don't know anything. That's why I say, if you're Jewish, if you're smart, one time come to the Bedin, tell them, convert me. What do I know who was my grand-grandmother? Especially if you're from Russia, from Lithuania, from Belarus, from India, places that were a lot of assimilation. Jews married a lot of Goim, Germany, France, all these places. Syria, almost nobody married Goim. Yaman, nobody ever married a Goy. Morocco, very few. Iran, very few. But in Europe, some places, almost everyone married Goim. Poland, almost everyone married Goim, besides the Hasidim. In Warsaw, when I spoke about the Holocaust, one uh, very old uh, uh, religious rabbi in Israel, Black Hat, he was 91 back then, today it's supposed to be 100, almost. Someone uh, with a camera went to him. So one rabbi in America, he doesn't know me. That's how I met him. He came with a video. So rabbi, you a Holocaust survivor from Warsaw. One rabbi from America said that the six million Jews that died in the Holocaust, many of them were not Jewish because of intermarriage. Because Jews marry non-Jewish women and all the children were going. The Nazis killed them as Jews. Is it true? Because in Germany maybe that was the case. But in Poland there were a lot of Hasidim. I mean in Poland there were a lot of religious people. So he said to the camera, he's a hundred percent right. I live in Warsaw. Half of the Jews there were married to non-Jewish women. In the, in the, living in a Jewish ghetto. Later I saw a film, documentary, from Warsaw, the Jewish community in Warsaw. You look at them, no kippah, all blurry out, look like 100% like Goim. You had Hasidim, and you have all the rest. And the rest were assimilated. And you know why in Poland it was harder to marry the Goim than Germany and France and all the other places? Because the Goim were so anti-Semite. They didn't want to marry the Jews. Not because the Jews didn't want to marry them. You know, in Belgium, almost no Jews marry Belgium. I was there in Antwerp. The husband and wife that hosted me, they told me, Baruch Hashem, over here, our children do not marry anyone but Jews. I said, how can it be? They said, they hate us so much, they do not agree to marry a Jew. Forget about to marry a Jew. They don't agree that a Jew will enter the home. Here, look at my husband with his electrician uniform. He works for a, Jew, for a Jewish landlord who owns buildings here in Antwerp. When there is a job, electric job, he sends my husband to fix it. Half of the people in Antwerp go in. As soon as they see him with the yarmulke and a beard, he, Jew, like this. They don't want him to enter. So she, so she said, even if they want, the Goim here don't want to marry Jews. Two places, there were no, three places there were no intermarriage. In Belgium, almost at all. In Panama, thanks to Rav Zion Levi, Allah Shalom. So anyone who would marry a convert or a Jew is done. He cannot enter the community, children cannot go to yeshivot. He cannot have weddings here, nothing is done with the community. So only 20 people in the history of Panama, when he was the chief rabbi, married non-Jews. And they had to be expelled. They went to live by the water, by the beach. And the day that Rav Zion Levi passed, few hours after his funeral, Hashem sent a hurricane to that neighborhood. There were 20 villas there of these 20 Jews who married Panam Panamian uh, non-Jewish girls and their 20 homes flew in the air. Nothing left from their neighborhood. That's a story that you can ask everyone from the Jewish community in Panama. Moments after he arrived to the court of heaven, I'm sure that that's the reason. He said to Hashem, these people rebelled against the chief rabbi of Panama. When I fought intermarriage, I gave my life to prevent it. They didn't care, they did Chilul Hashem and they moved out of the community for a non-Jewish girl. I demand justice. What happened? Psh, hurricane. This is what few people in Panama told me. And the third place is Yaman. Not only the Temanim never married Goim, there was never one Mechalel Shabbat in the history of Yaman. Until today for 2,600 years. One country, 
Millions of Jews lived there in the last 2,600 years, and not one of them was secular. Ask yourself, how come? Every other country, you have Mechalele Shabbat. Morocco, Iraq, Iran, all Ashkenaz, plenty of Mechalele Shabbat, even in Syria, even in Lebanon. There were Mechalele Shabbat, Israel, plenty of Mechalele Shabbat. America, almost everyone Mechalele Shabbat. Yaman, never one Mechalele Shabbat. Why? Nobody went to university over there. University is the number one poison to a person's life. It's guaranteed to make you an enemy of God. Guaranteed to make you an infidel. Guaranteed to make you an heretic. Kofer, apikores. According to Allah, almost all people who go to universities, including the Jewish one in Manhattan, almost all of them are kofrim. Look at all the speakers who came out of there, what, they, what garbage they, they speak, how to believe. Once Torah and academy get mixed, they disrespect the Torah. Eh, we are academic, I'm a doctor. You know the clown from London? The one that say homosexuality and feminism is wonderful development to humanity? In one of his speeches, you know what he said? Don't you feel that the words of Chazal are sometimes musky, meaning rusty, old-fashioned, don't belong to our days, Chazal, primitive. Ah, come on, we live in the 21st century. I also do. If someone like this would speak like this in the time of Chazal, he wouldn't survive until the next day. No one will ever talk to him. No one. Until today, still in London, guess how much he makes a year? One million dollar basic salary. In London, in a synagogue of Kofrim, they made this clown, the rabbi. He comes to the synagogue and he makes a series. What's his teaching? A book of a big kofer that deny God and deny the Torah, that's what they learn daily. Instead of learning Mara, Alcha, he take a book of a famous kofer, and that's what they learn in a synagogue. No joke. People send me material from there. A flyer. What is the next series? <coughs> Sefer Shel Kfira. They learn in a shul. Now you understand why the stupid people run to pay him a million dollars. Rav Ovadia was receiving a million dollars for being a rabbi. Any big, real rabbi in the history was getting such salaries? No. Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul paid for the little salary from Porat Yosef to his students that they will have food for Shabbat. One time he saw one having difficulty. He said, I want you to hire a tutor, and whatever it costs, I will pay. To bring a student up to the shiur in Porat Yosef in high school. For, I said to him, well, you are you are Rebbe here. You barely make money. How are you going to pay a private tutor for a stranger? He said, we have to bring him up to the shiur <laughs> from the little salary they were making. When you see millions are coming easy, investigate. <laughs> the Satan does not let people get millions of dollars when they really in Kedusha. Everything that is pure and serious and holy in the eyes of Hashem, the Satan gives all his energy to sabotage it. If the Satan promotes an heretic, that means he's doing his job. If the Satan promotes a group that worships someone that is alive or someone that has died and gives them millions of dollars and money comes from all over, there's a reason for it. They do the job for him, he doesn't have to do anything. They influence a lot of people to become idol worshippers. That's why the Satan gives them all the money. Look at all the reform. Temples, 50 million, 100 million, 200 million dollars. Nobody comes to pray there. <laughs> Do you need a 100 million dollar synagogue in Manhattan with all kinds of uh, special art? Why? The Satan is happy. Let the money go to places of impurity, to ma. Ah, come to the best yeshivot in the world. Most of them are in Israel. Floods, dripping, the floor is full of water, no money for coffee. In places, you want air condition? 
You have 500 people in a shul in the month of August in Bnei Brak. Do you know what a sauna? Do you know the smell of the sweat? People came out of the shower two hours ago. The place, you cannot breathe, you know, because it's humid. It's crazy humid. 100 degrees, 100% humidity, no air condition. It's like sardines. You need one shekel. A quarter. 30 cents. You put it in air condition, it will turn on for five minutes, for one shekel. You want an hour, you put four shekel, one dollar. There will be air conditioned for 500 people who came to pray for one dollar. I first time went to that place, hey, Itzkovich, it's called. It's one of the greatest places of Tom. And stop praying. I say to myself, wow, how they, how they're not turning the air condition here? Can I breathe? Can I focus on the prayers? Dripping sweat in your back, in your legs. Your pants sticking to your legs, your, your back is itching, or you're, you're, you're dying, you want to take off your hat, you cannot breathe. <laughs> then I see one guy, comes, put a few coins, air conditioner. I say, wow, I wish I would know it 15 minutes ago. <laughs> I put all my coins there. That's when I realized there's such thing. You know, and I, I pray in yeshiva every Shabbat in the Nets, Nets Minyan. Now Nets was six, uh, seven, uh, or eight, because they changed the clock. So I'm the chazan, I'm the, the one who prays. So I put the talit on my head. But you know, in yeshiva they put the heat, and I'm suffering from heat. I don't like it. In my house I barely ever put heat, mamash, and it's really freezing. I put on 60, 65, it's already hot for me. Sometimes I have guests from Israel, they sleep in my basement. I walk downstairs to go to the car. Wave of an oven. They put the heat on 90. 90! And they still freeze. I hate the heat. So, you know, so, uh, you know, this place that uh, it's so hot and so humid. So in this, in this, in a yeshiva, I pray. I have to to scream because when you chazan, you sing, you sweat even more. So I only cover my head in a kriyat shema, and it's filat shmona esri. When I say psukim zimra, hallelujah. So the rosh yeshiva come to me and say, "Tell me why you cover your head and take off the talit. Cover your head, put the talit." I said to him, I cannot breathe. Once I put the talit, it closes, the heat comes right here from the heater. I, it's hard to sing loud, and at the same time, you cannot breathe from the heat, and plus I'm beginning to sweat. It ruins my concentration. I cannot breathe. So what he answered me? So don't breathe. <laughs> I said, I said, well, very good. He said to me one time I was in a hospital, there was the son-in-law of Shimon Perez in a hospital with me in a room. I said, no. He said, he had problem breathing. So he was screaming, doctor, doctor, I can't breathe. I cannot breathe. So the Israeli doctor walks by, I not <laughs> So don't breathe. <laughs> Die. That's when he wanted to tell me the joke. He can't breathe. So don't breathe. The point, Rabotai, and I'm finishing here. In the end, Rabotai, many people have eyes, their eyes are open, they think they see, they understand, but they don't see anything. They don't understand anything, they don't see anything, until Hashem open up their eyes. So for that, it's called Siata Dishmaya, help from heaven. We have to pray to Hashem all the time, three times a day, every time. Shachrit, Mincharit, please open my eyes. Let me see who is kosher, who is fake. Who should I stick to, who should I run away from? Make my ashkafa accurate. Ashkafa, ashkafa, it's everything in life. I spoke in a yeshiva in Great Neck this way a few days ago. 
I told them all of you are בני תורה, you give your life for the Torah, you serious בני תורה. Your rabbi has many reasons to be proud. But if I'm going to start testing you one by one, you're going to be shocked how much your hashkafa is off, your ideology is off. I started to give examples. I saw from their body language they were shocked. Because many people learn, 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 but they don't see the hashkafa. That's why I found a way to help people. Say, so, listen, buy all the books of Rabbi Avigdor Miller, all of them. It's a treasure. It's worth any amount of money. And learn them one by one. Chovot al vavot, alachot, she'elot v'tshuvot, parashat ha-shavua, on the Holocaust, everything. After a year or two that you read all these books, you'll be the most educated person in the world in Judaism. The most educated, in Ashkafa. You will be a living and thinking small god walking in the street. Whatever Hashem thinks, it will be your mind. Whatever Hashem loves, you would love. Whatever Hashem hates, you will hate. Right now, there's a big salad in our head. Big. People kiss up to the wicked. People admire the wicked. People have hopes in corrupted politicians. People have hopes in Israeli army, in the United States, in the Mossad, in Iran, in the airplane, in the Air Force. A huge salad in their head. No emuna, no confidence in Hashem. Huge confusion. They see it in the Shiduchim. Guys, girls, I don't know. Shiduchim, even to go on a date, they don't know how to behave. Finally, they get engaged, they don't know how to treat their in-laws, their new in-laws. They're making mistakes of rookies. You know, first impression can ruin your life. You just met your in-laws. One, two, five sentences that you're going to say destroyed your relationship with them for the next 40 years. It's critical. If your hashkafa is not accurate, you make huge mistakes. You don't know what's ikar and what's tafel. When you go on a date with a girl, everything is great about her except one thing. That one thing sometimes can be worse than all the good and sometimes could be worthless. It's really no big deal. No big deal at all. No reason to cancel shiduch, definitely. But people don't know. They make mistakes. First they do and then they go to ask. Rabbi, I think I made a mistake. I went on with a girl and this and I told her this and that. Oh, okay, you ruined the shiduch. That's, that's probably she won't agree to date you again. Then he's begging. It was a mistake. I didn't mean it. Too late. His life is finished. One sentence ruins life. One sentence can ruin your life. In Israel, if you say one sentence in the wrong place, you can get arrested and they destroy your life. Shabak, investigation, fingerprints, they listen to you, they put spying things in your phones, they listen to every bit you make. They can surveillance you from a satellite. You come out of your home, you look at your phone, from a satellite they see what text you're reading. They zoom. They cannot see Hamas terrorists pretend, preparing a, a massacre of 1,500 people for years. They pre prepare such a logistic operation. They didn't see anything. Come on, you really believe it? Of course they saw. But they are traders from inside, these lefty Libras. There are thousands of people like Bernie Sanders in the system. They control Israel's security. They want Israel to be destroyed. They want Israel to become a country of international people. They hate the religious so much. They hate religion so much and religious people so much. They willing to give Israel to the Arabs and to the rest of the world and to destroy Israel as long as they hurt the religious people. For them, it's the mission of life. Listen to what they speak nonstop on the news, nonstop. Haredim, 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 all day. Tell them you don't care that the country is going down the drain. Haredim are my real enemies. That's all they talk about. We as the people who keep Torah and Mitzvot have so much to improve, Rabotai, so much. I urge you, please, don't just listen and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tomorrow morning, make sure you already have at least one book. While you're finishing it, make sure you get another one and another one and another until you will be an expert living tzaddik, thinking Judaism, operating, mamash like a chazal, chazal, everything. 
you know what's real, what's not, Zionism, communism, the nation, righteous goyim, wicked goyim, idol worshiper Jews, everything will be clear by you. Everything will be black and white. Emet sheker, emet sheker. Right now, there are millions of people and hundreds of thousands of religious people that almost everything by them is gray. They don't know, nothing. You ask them. Should I do it? Should I not do it? Should I go to the wedding? Should I not go? Mixed dancing. My wife allowed to go. It's her brother. My kids want to play with their cousin. They're not Shomer Shabbat. I don't know. Maybe they have TV there. Allowed to let them go. Not allowed. What should I say? There are millions of questions. You deal with that every second of your life. Every second of your life. One, two, five mistakes. Your family is finished. You move on with your life like nothing happened. You have a brother that is a criminal against Hashem. What are you about to do about it? How can you sleep at night? How can you sleep at night? Your sister, your brother, your brother-in-law, your own parents. You have a son went off the derech. You have a modern orthodox son. How do you handle it? Rivka was told she thought she has one faker in her stomach. One minute he wants to go out by the church. Another minute he wants to go out by the yeshiva. Make up your mind. Are you tzaddik or are you rasha idol worshiper? She got very nervous. She came to Shem, Gdol Ador. He told her, relax, it's not one kid. It's two nations, one tzaddik, one rasha. She had a relief. What kind of a relief you have? You just found out you have one kid is a tzaddik rabbi, the founder of the Jewish nation, and the other one is the founder of Amalek and the Nazis. What kind of a relief is that? Better to have one tzaddik and one rasha than one half and half. Half and half faker from the university with his little quarter on his head. Why? They are the most dangerous one. Just when you don't realize they stab you in the back. Stab you in the back. Now it's a perfect example. A lot of them with the yamaka on their head speaking against the Haredim that they should go to the army. What kind of a normal religious man wants 150,000 people that learn Torah non-stop and save the Jewish nation for massive holocaust that we deserve to get right now? And thanks to them, we're not getting it. To close all the yeshivot and send all of them to the army. You believe such thing? Today, the, the treasury, Smotrich, I told him, my friend. I spoke to him a few times, picked him on WhatsApp. And before he became Sar Tzar, I went to his office, we said, he made a lot of promises that once he's got, this is before he became a minister, that once he will be a minister, he will help to do outreach, to help a lot of Jews, to help Jews to go to yeshivot. After they go to become big shots, they don't remember, they, it takes two weeks until they check your message. This is how they are. But it's okay. We don't care about this. But today he comes and say, it cannot go on like that anymore. I won't rest until all the Haredim will go to the army. You little fool. This is worse than a million holocaust. If the, the group that thanks to them we breathe and we are alive will close the yeshivot and go to become secular soldiers like the rest, that's the end of the Jewish nation. You won't have a thousand Jews left in the world. What are you, normal? Billions of anti-Semite Nazis are waiting for the second they slaughter us all. Not only the Arabs. Millions in Europe and hundreds of millions in the rest of the world. Just wait for the opportunity to burn all Jews alive. The only reason we didn't get killed for the thousands of years is only the Torah. This is what Hashem said, not me. Im lo briti yomam v'alayla chukot shamayim v'aretz lo samdi. Everything we have is thanks to the Torah. Everything. Especially the young children who learn Torah with no sins. And this genius with his yamaka, he wants to get uh, recognition, publicity, you know, good feedback from the Israeli wicked people. So what does he say? I'm with you. We should close all the yeshivot and send them all to the army. What do we need? Do we really need 160,000 new soldiers, Haredim, Hasidim, that don't know how to hold a knife? What exactly are they going to do in Gaza, these Hasidim? Speak Yiddish to Ahmed, Ahmed, who's Marsti? What are they going to do? He knows it's not realistic. But why are they saying it? 
because they are not real, they are all fakers. Someone that loves Hashem and fear Hashem will dare to say, I want to take all the tzaddikim from the yeshivot and send them to the army, and you're out of your mind, you lose your olam haba in one minute. With all your yamaka and tzitzit and shmirat shabbat. In one minute you lose your olam haba. This is what the Greeks wanted to do. The Greeks wanted to cancel the Torah from Am Israel. They don't want to murder us. Haman want to murder everyone. But the Greeks didn't want to kill one Jew. They just wanted to cancel the Torah. Say that you're not religious anymore. We will promote you. That's why we celebrate Hanukkah. Who celebrate Hanukkah? The people that hate the Torah and want to burn the Torah and want to burn the rabbis. And want to close all the yeshivot, they light the menorah. Asher asa nisim lavotenu, bayamim ayem, bazman ala, you fool. The nisim of Hanukkah is that Hashem saved us from people like you. What are you lighting the menorah, you fool? You are the Greek that we are talking about. You, the Jew from Tel Aviv, the Jew from the Knesset. The liberal lefty, pro Hamas that hates the yeshivot so much. What are you lighting the menorah for? The whole menorah is that Hashem saved us from monsters like you. But in Israel it got even worse. They had a basketball game in Tel Aviv. There is a basketball team, Maccabi Tel Aviv. Almost all the prayers are going. Maybe one or two are Jewish. And they have a, a, a coach from Greece. <laughs> Scrampunopoulos, some kind of, you know, the Greeks have names from here all the way to Harlem. So the Greek, the Greek, the guy, he likes the menorah. <laughs> the Greek. I said, I said, what is going on here? A bunch of fools from Tel Aviv, they don't know from left and right. They say, hey, coach, come, you like the menorah. So, like, so the guy, I don't know, he's reading. Baruch Atag, Hashem, you know, the Goy, the Greek. He lights the menorah and all the black players from, the basketball player, you know, all these giants. <laughs> they go like this. They don't know what's going on. How do you expect them not to hate religion? They don't even know what it is. This is what Purim is all about, Rabotai. Purim and Hanukkah will never lose their value, even when Mashiach comes. Why? Because those two salvations are special for Hashem. Even more than the exodus of Egypt. Once Mashiach comes, there will be a final salvation. The exodus of Egypt would look like a joke compared to the final salvation. But Hanukkah and Purim will always remain. Especially Purim. You know why? Why Purim is more special than Hanukkah? Not one Jew died. There was a signed decree that all Jews will die in a few months, now one will be left, and all their property will be seized and stolen by the Goim. Now one Jew died, not one Jew got injured, not one Jew broke a finger, not one drop of a Jew spilled in the entire year. When there is a Holocaust coming, the Goim are preparing for the moment to slaughter and burn all the Jews. Now one Jew died. And in the end, it all turned around and the Jews killed 75,500 Nazis. And not one Jew got hurt. Hanukkah, maybe Jew, many Jews got lost. Pesach, 80% of the Jewish nation died in, the, in Makat Choshech. 12 million Jews died in the exodus of Egypt. 80% of the nation got wiped out. Didn't go out and didn't see the Torah, didn't get the Torah. Every other salvation. Thousands and hundreds of thousands died. Purim? No. Not one, not one got injured. Do you understand what Purim, Rabotai? Now when we got the whole thing, the rest tomorrow, Bezrat Hashem, Baruch Adonai Leolam. Amen ve Amen. Rabbi Hanania ben Akashia Omer, Atzai, Kedosh Baruch Hu, Lezakot, Yisraelim, Shechav, Yomar, Torah, Mitzvot.